lineup of your favorite show and producer, 5'11", from Blanchester, the cow killer, Casey McAllister, and comic engineer, standing at 4'8", the pride of the west side, Elliot Rearing. We're back. We're back. I didn't think we would ever get back at one point during that trip, but I'm glad to be back, and I'm sure many of you are very thankful that I, that I was away for two weeks, but the bad news is, is I did make it back. I do have a full cast of characters in here today. I, I, I decided on, um, when I was watching the trip, um, I don't know what stop we were in. Maybe it was Vegas, and uh, just, just hap, hap, haphazardly, I think is the term I'm looking to use, turned on on off the bench and there Reed was giving a, a, a very eloquent point. I was reading the chat. Many people weren't happy about it. So I thought, you know what? That's the guy for the job. I don't know how we get it to where he's full time, but doesn't want to quit. That's the concern I have. You see, that's the thing. Reed's, uh, Reed's valuable at this company. So realistically speaking, if I made him host this show every single day, I know what inevitably would happen after about three or four weeks go by of, uh, after the two weeks he already did, it would turn into, you know what, I, this, I, I really wish I could just go back to, to uh, pop, not, not hosting the show, et cetera, et cetera. But by that point, you're too far in. So at some point, maybe we bamboozle him. We've got to figure out a, a time frame in which we can slide it in there to where things are going right. It's going to have to be when maybe the Bengals are getting ready to get started, and then that can kind of carry itself over. The problem is, is, I was thinking, if you could combine me and Reed somehow, some way, and you could just take our fandoms and mix and match them, you would have the perfect host for this show. But having a Cubs fan host this show all summer long, I don't know if that's good or bad. Sometimes I wonder if you have someone up here that everybody hates, it's actually good. If you have somebody up here that everybody likes, maybe that's good too. I don't know. Or maybe it's a mixture of both. So what I decided was, I decided that Reed has to be in here every single day if he's, a, if, if he's, if he's capable. Now here's the thing with Reed. He genuinely did do a great job. The problem is now, is that he thinks that he's some fill-in. So now you get these, these texts, these uh, subliminal texts. They're like, well, I'm just this AAA bat. Well, I'd like to consider him Stuart Fairchild. See, Stuart Fairchild, he takes some slander from time to time, but I think he's a pretty damn good ball player. And you know what? Just so happens that there's times in life where you, you got to step up and you're the man. And then when you step up, you find out if you can do it or not. He's not Stuart Fairchild. He's Jonathan India, leader of the clubhouse, spiritual leader. Ain't that right? I don't, I don't like any of these. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't like any of those analogies. I don't think I liked a single thing that was said. I think the reason that you asked me to be on the show was it, wasn't because of the job I did. I think I just ran out of options, just going down and back and forth between Louisville and Cincinnati. So you're like, yeah, we well, it's, I got to fire him or he's just on the show full time. You're and, saying you're the Jose Barrero, but we decided to keep you. Right. Like it was, it was fire me or, or keep me on the show. And, and I guess you did the, the latter. So it, it is what it is. I think everyone uh, enjoyed the two weeks I was hosting until uh, yesterday. Someone put in the <laughs> chat, said that I was trying to burn the show down. With a vengeance when I said that uh, Justin Fields was closer to Josh Rosen than he was Lamar Jackson, and that went over as, about as well as you expected it to go over. But it is what it is. Yeah. Lindsay's in the room as well. Uh, we, have a, we have basically the, the whole entire office in here besides Sean. So, Sean, I guess Sean right now is um, uh, he's Brandon Williamson or someone like that. Who's, he's done a really good job when they're in here, but nobody ever really gives a full chance to. they just just like, ah, <laughs> oh, you know what? I know, I know, Brandon, I know that you've thrown the ball just as well as Andrew Abbott, for the most part. I, I know that maybe you could argue that, that you weren't supposed to be good, but you kind of were good. But here's the thing. We're, you're just going to have to sit on the side until, until we decide that, uh, that you're good to go again. But a lot has happened since I've been gone. Um, I don't know really how you dissect all the things that happened since I've been gone to an, an eloquent degree. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip over things that probably already talked about. The vast majority of the things that happened were NFL news. Uh, Justin Fields, very, very high valued. Somebody that obviously the rest of the league looks at as a great quarterback and something that, that, that you really couldn't find anywhere else. So that's why he got um, basically a seventh-round pick for him uh, going to the Steelers. So good for him. Don't do that. 
D- d- they don't, don't like that. D- don't do that. Okay. That, that's a big no-no. Don't well, do that. Well, I, 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 I just wonder how in the world that, that the Pittsburgh Steelers decided they were going to go get uh, Russell Wilson, and then five days later, basically, they, they find a way. They, they, the, the value is so good, right? The value. That's one thing we learned on the Correct. trip, uh, Elliot, is that value is really the, ma- the thing that matters the most. It doesn't matter how many quarterbacks you have. If you can find good value in six quarterbacks, then you carry six quarterbacks. Um, the thing is that they decided the value was so great with Justin Fields, they already had one quarterback, they had to double down and get another one. Or is there a possibility, and this is what I would be worried about if I was a Bengals fan, I really wouldn't be concerned about the Pittsburgh Steelers in regards to who they have behind center at quarterback. I would be more concerned if they find a way to put Justin Fields in a halfback role and, he, and he's able to catch passes out of the backfield. Now you're on to something. Now you got to be concerned. You don't think that's a real – I guess – I know everybody thinks this is a bit. Oh, chuckle, chuckle, Trace might make a bad joke. Oh, it's joke. absolutely a bit. Do you, but do you not think that's in the realm of possibility? Correct. That is not in the realm of possibilities. This Justin, Fields, Justin Fields will never play a position outside quarterback in the NFL. Yes or no? He will never play running back in the NFL. This is, this is fantastic because I slandered Justin Fields a lot over the last two weeks. But in the first seven minutes, you surpassed it. So I, it was good. That was good. <laughs> I'm saying he's an unbelievable athlete. I, when you watch him play, Justin Fields, he, he quickly, you can tell that he is different athletically than a lot of guys. Like almost, almost sometimes everybody on the field. The issue is at quarterback, you don't always get to use the full breadth of your athleticism. You're asked to do things that maybe are a little more skillful in nature. And I don't know if that's really what he's great at. That's my, that's my push to say, hey, put this guy's in position to win. If you have two quarterbacks, you have zero. That's how I feel. So I don't know if the Steelers are going to try some what? weird thing where they play two guys. and They said that Justin Fields is not going to compete for the job. The interesting thing that I, that I really didn't touch on yesterday was the, the, the reports came out that Justin Fields wanted to go to Pittsburgh. Like he wanted, which like bravo to him, because I guess he like had a great time. Spur was telling me he had a great time playing there his rookie year and, and loved the atmosphere and everything like that. But that read to me like Justin Fields wants to be a backup, because that's what's gonna happen. He's the backup, so like this, like that. It just is a weird situation that yeah, you want to go to a franchise that wins a lot in, in Pittsburgh, but you want to go be a backup. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You want to go to a defensive coach. A, a team that doesn't have a whole lot of offensive success, it, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but neither here nor there. Justin Fields is certainly in a unique spot now. He was the man. He got drafted to be the man. He started to have some weapons that were coming around him. Even last year, he kind of got some a, a little bit of a better uh, talent pool around him. I know many people would say his line was terrible, and, and maybe I'll give you that, but – They've added enough weapons now to where it was going to be if Justin Fields didn't perform this year, then it was more on Justin Fields than it was on the organization. So we'll see how that ultimately goes. Uh, in other news, there was a million different things that have happened throughout Major League Baseball. Maybe Blake Snell just signed yesterday. The whole, the whole uh, Scott Boris group of, uh, of players have kind of found themselves in a position where they didn't get what they wanted. Is Scott Boris washed? I don't know. Time will tell. Or is the owners just deciding, you know what, we're not doing these big contracts anymore. We're not doing it. If you guys want $250 million, then go somewhere else. We're not doing that. Because it's not worked out for a whole lot of teams. Mega contracts, again, something that got me in trouble, uh, I guess, a couple months ago, are, are not something that have really worked out a whole significant time, amount of time for organizations. Joey Votto had probably one of the most lucrative team options. Like, when they signed Joey Votto, there's nobody that has even what, what I would call a relative right frame of mind that could tell you that the Joey Votto contract was a bad contract, yet you still have, you still have individuals and still have people that want to argue that it wasn't, it wasn't the right thing for the team or the franchise to do. Now, that's more, that's more telling of the ownership group than anything, but that's my point. We'll see if it matters uh, at all in regards to what these guys wanted and what they got. But the, the biggest thing uh, that I kind of take away was I walked in today was March Madness was on, uh, or Selection Sunday was, was obviously a few days ago. I used to be the kid in class. Um, and again, I know as I keep speaking on my educational um, career, many of you are thinking that I was a horrible student, and I was. Um, but I used to sneak in back in the day, says, I guess I'm getting old now. Uh, I used to sneak in those little old 
TVs. I don't know if you ever, Elliot, I'm guessing Reed, maybe uh, Lindsay certainly hasn't ever seen these. We had smartphones. But yeah, so <laughs> there you have it. But I used to sneak in old antenna <laughs> televisions and I would stick it in my book bag and the, in the, basically the antenna would stick out of the top of it and I would dial it in and I'd find the local channel just to, just to be able to watch March Madness basketball while I was in class. Yeah, luckily they don't have that anymore. They, we have laptops in this, this era of the future that we live in. Uh, you just go on your laptop and then you type in marchmadness.com and then boom, you get to watch every game you want uh, for free. And then you get to act like you're working. That was my favorite part of school when, especially shout out Elder High School, they found a way to kind of rig the system where all our computers were synced up to the same network so they know who was watching it. But at some point when literally a, a, a school of 800 kids, 750 of them are watching the same thing, they gave up and they quit. But the March Madness app did uh, include a new feature over, I think it was like 10 years ago probably. They, it, there was a, a, a boss button. So if you, typed, if you clicked the boss button, it just pulled up a random PowerPoint on your screen and that's how you hid your how how you hid your uh, March Madness watching. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. I didn't I didn't bring like a a box TV in my book bag. That <laughs> seems kind of crazy, but that's all, that's the only way you could do it. And the crazy thing is, uh, me and Sean used to actually buy. We we used to try to beg and convince his mom to purchase the uh, the extra sports package or whatever it was. I think it was like seventy five dollars something. Wow, back then that was very very expensive. Um, but that's how you were able to watch all the games. Yeah. Now you can watch all the games for free on the on, basically on your like you said on your electronic devices no problem at all but uh, but yeah back in the day you used to only get the local TV game so if it wasn't on channel 12 or whatever channel it would have been back then the local CBS oh, that's station terrible. that's all you were watching that's terrible that's all you were getting yeah, You'd have to, in fact, they would like show they would you know the little cut in highlights they'd have. Yeah, that was what you got to see of the other games. Talk about a tease. What talk, a te talk about at the end of a game when it was really close uh, on another game and you were watching a blowout, you were just begging for the blowout to end so they would cut over to the other game before the other game started. That's the, that's the pain we were under. The only app that does it just as good as March Madness is the Masters. Those are the only two that have nailed streaming down. You can watch any game, anytime, anywhere. I don't think you have to put any of your like um, cable provider information in anywhere, so you just get to watch True TV for free right on your phone. And shout out to True TV, another year that True TV uh, gets March Madness. Nobody ever knows what it is. They know it's the Impractical Jokers channel. Right. But again, I'm I'm thrilled. I, March Madness is quite literally the next what is it four or five days here. Uh, it's my favorite. It's my favorite time of the year by far, by far, wide margin. It is wild how quickly technological advances happen. Um... And obviously, you get old, and so you start to realize that maybe, uh, maybe you're not young anymore. But I like to think that I'm still relatively young. And the idea that when I was in school, high school, nonetheless, that's what we were doing. We were pulling out basically, like you called it, box televisions. I'm gonna see if I can't get a hold of one of those and bring it in. Please, do you have, do you, have you never seen these? I mean, I've seen a box. I've had a I had a box TV growing up. I'm talking I about didn't... like no, I'm talking about the ones that you like <clears throat> portable. No, I didn't have a portable one. Are those the ones that that was like the one in Drake and Josh where you crank right when the when the storm goes out and you crank it up? Is that right? That's what we're doing. Here? I don't know. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but it was like yay big, like it looked like a ti ti eighty four small ca calculator and it had like a tiny screen at the top and then yes. like the dials at the bottom and had antennas coming out of it, right? Yes. God, you are old. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess I am. Here I am. Uh, gone for two weeks. Uh, you learn a lot about some people. You learn you learn a uh, little the the ticks of some and maybe the things of others. The, t the trip was going great, right? Trip was going great. It was going great. Um, we'll get into obviously some, some serious sports talk because I know this is a serious sports talk show. Just in a moment, um, and this is how you know I'm very very rusty because we're like 15 minutes into the show, and I I do want to say that this is off the bench presented by United Dairy Farmers. Uh, we come your way, we come your way every day from ten a to twelve p. Uh, today we might go a little long because we have so much to talk about. Uh, we have someone from the road trip that's going to join us uh, right around the twelve o'clock hour. Um, we'll see where that leads, where that happens. But the trip itself, uh, overall, I'll let Elliot speak for himself. Overall, it was uh, it was it was a great time. Clearly, when you're gone for twelve days, there there becomes a moment in time where you wish you were home. We certainly found where, where that was in the trip. Tip of the iceberg, though, um, I was thinking. I, this is, we have to tell this story. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Kirby's not here to defend himself. So 
let's be fair. I'll be fair in saying, hey, he'll be able to sell, tell his side of the story one day. Um, and he has shows with us, so he can tell his side of the story. That's fine. No problem. He's probably in the chat. But we, we, we show up to Goodyear, right? First day. Elliot, we've probably been on the road nonstop for, and we 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 did this to ourselves. This isn't. I'm not making. A, this isn't us. This is a pity party. Is no, Elliot. this is not a pity party. No, it's just saying that we went from from you know basically Hamilton to uh, Lawrence, which is about eight and a half hours. Then right when the game was over, we we went to like two thirty in the morning to make sure we could get to uh, Denver at a reasonable time so we can get the Avalanche game, which was another six hours. Then we did have one day inside of uh, inside of Denver, but we drove to um, the Rocky Mountains, which was like actually like oddly enough like two hours away. Yep. So we had four hours of driving that day. The next day we had a twelve-hour drive uh, to the to the Grand Canyon. After the Grand Canyon, we had a five-hour drive to Phoenix, and then we went from Phoenix to Vegas, which was so we. I mean. When I tell you I pulled into the office today with the van. By the way, the van deserves all the credit in the world. What a, what, what a remarkable performance. Not one single time did I ever think that we were going down. No. The only time I actually considered it was two times. One was when you were in manual um, for the first maybe two minutes of Vegas when yep. we were leaving. And we were just running at 8,000 RPMs for about a minute and a half. And I was like, something's not right here. So I looked over. It turns out we were just in first gear. Um, then the second time was we were in the Rocky Mountains and we were going down incredibly steep inclines and, and, and it was, we were running some high RPMs. But outside of that, it was, it was incredible. So we decided, you know, we, we get into Goodyear and it's like, okay, we, it'd be nice just to get some sleep, no problem. Turns out that wasn't the plan. Well, I think that, and that was the, that was the, that was the part that like maybe upset me a little bit, not upset me, but, uh, got on my nerves a little bit because everybody knew once we got to Goodyear and we were able to stay in one place up until that point, we had not stayed really in one yeah. place. That was like the, the light more, at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. For the more than a day and a half. Uh, and you're good. You get to Arizona. You're like, okay, we get to sleep in a little bit. We get to have some fun. We're, we're watching baseball. Everything's good in the world. And I think it's the second day, the, the morning. So we get there that, that night. We watch a Reds game. Marty comes and visits us. So he says hello. And then it's that next morning, right? Yeah. Vibes were high. Vibes were high. Kirby says, listen, we're leaving at 8. We're leaving at 8 a.m. We got to get there early. We got to go. We got to go see some young players. We got to take a tour of the facility. Uh, by the way, that's only going to be me and Trace that sees the tour. But that's okay. We're going to go see the tour. Uh, everybody else, I guess you can uh, find out whatever you want to do for the rest of the hours that we're on the tour. But we get there early at 8. Gates don't open till 9. So uh, luckily for us, Kirby did have to go to several different convenience stores to get multiple pairs of sunglasses beforehand. So we didn't get there too early. Got there around like 8.45, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, I think Trace and I, we were having some fun with the video because all the gates were, we were locked out of the facility. We made a funny little video and said how Kirby woke us all up for nothing. We could have slept in for an hour and a half extra because they're not letting us in. And then Kirby gets a little angry, walks back to where we are in the facility once they eventually open the gates. Yeah, because we, we, we luckily beat them in, right? We beat, we beat them so in. So we, we, we decided we were just going to walk around the facility, skip rocks, try to find things to do because we, we genuinely – I mean, we were standing outside of an a, of a empty complex – yeah, you know, outside of the groundskeepers, and we were just trying to find our way. We were just like, it was a night. To be fair, it was a beautiful day. It beautiful. was like it was it was it was really nice. We were just we were taking and soaking up the sun, not as much as Lindsay, but we were soaking up the sun. That's right. And we got to the other side of the we got to the other side of the complex. And it just so happened that they opened the gate like right when we were walking by. And so Ker Kirby's on the opposite side of the complex. Kirby's on the opposite side. So yeah. we get in. At this point, we're watching a bunch of reds minor leaguers that you have no idea who they are and neither do we they were doing high knees and all kinds of other cool stretches but once Kirby walked over I could tell he was upset because he didn't initially come say hello to us yeah he, he walked over to one of the four practice fields they have and he started looking at the players he started looking at them taking some pictures and he comes back over after about 10 minutes we, we were sitting on the bleachers just watching him not pay attention to us he comes back over after 10 minutes clearly mad at us very mad at us and he comes over and says so what are we doing are we getting serious reds content or are we doing bits and, and and we're like what are you talking about 
I'm just over there taking pictures of one of the greatest Reds prospects you've ever seen. His name. No, 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 no. I want you to do this verbatim. Don't, don't, don't short sight the story because you're, you're starting to, you're starting to do that. He came over and he said, I said, uh, we asked the question, rightfully so. Guys doing calisthenics in the outfield, by the way. I mean, just doing high knees and, you know, they're just doing lunges. We're stretching. We're glorified stretching. At this oh, yeah. Point. Uh, it was so serious that the starting shortstop, by the way, Edwin Arroyo of the, uh, of the inner squad, uh, he wasn't doing calisthenics. He was just shooting the shit, basically, with all the pitching coaches and stuff around the mound because he was big. He was big leaguing the minor leaguers as a non-big Correct. leaguer. That's what was going on. But nonetheless, uh, we asked, what, what, what is there? You know, we were like, what, what are we supposed to be doing? What serious, we, we took him serious. Yeah. What serious Reds content are we doing? I'll, I'll do some serious Reds content. And he comes over. Well, you guys. He, and he comes over. Well, you guys won't believe this. I just took a picture of Shang N. Lin, one of the greatest Reds prospects. Signed him to a minor league deal from overseas. He's, he's great. And we're like, oh, wow. That, that sounds pretty big. What, what was he doing over there that warranted such a, a, a beautiful picture? And Kirby, with as straight of a face as he could have said, and maybe this is where, and this is where I was, my brain started to get fried because when he said it, I laughed out loud. I was getting very serious pictures of Sheng and Lin. What was he doing, Kirby? Oh, he was standing. He was standing up, and, and we were supposed to take photos of him standing. That was his big accomplishment, and it was one of the more preposterous things I've ever seen. And really, that was the downfall of everything, because his idea of a serious bit uh, or a serious Reds content was filming a man standing up doing nothing. What a time! What a time to be alive! Yeah, I mean that's you, you're slandering him a little tough there, but 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 it, we did then we both laughed, and uh, I don't think that helped us. By the way, I think that that hurt that hurt our cause, um, but it was funny nonetheless. And we'll get into more and more of those stories throughout the, throughout the trip, but that one probably took the cake on, uh, on the disconnect. Uh, Kirby did put in the chat that he doesn't recommend going to uh, spring training with guys that don't like baseball. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that? I love baseball. I love it, love it, love it. But it was very clear. Uh, that's when the fun part of the that's, – that's really, when I think, when everybody's brain broke. And, and outside of Greg, Greg – shout out Greg – uh, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah's brain never broke really all the way through, but everybody else was starting to get pissy with one another. Uh, and the vibes went downhill quickly once we got to Arizona. Yeah. I lo- I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought spring training was great. Uh, I, the Reds got mad at us. Shout out to the Reds. Yeah. But not happy. Other than that, I, I thought we did a great job covering Shang and Lin. That's his name. Yeah, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Um, if he makes the big leagues, I'll figure it out. So here's the thing. It was it was one of those trips where towards the end, you realized, okay, maybe this is it. If it wasn't for Connor Gate, I don't think we would have ever really been in a tough spot, but Connor Gate kind of like flipped the – that was uh, 100% the breaking point, but we'll get into that another show another day. There's too many things to talk about that are relatively insightful in regards to sports. We try to, we try to like push through uh, shows around here from time to time when there's really no content at all, but now there's a lot of sports content. Mm-hmm. Reed, how was it? How was it doing shows where you actually had something to talk about? It was fantastic. It was, uh, you know, I we we did the show like last Sunday. Uh, I I sent you guys a text and I was like, hey, I'm I'm, you know, I'm planning out the show. Can you guys come on the show on Monday to, to give me some to, to to give me something to talk about? Because I had nothing. And then Monday just turned out to be the greatest day in NFL sports history. That starting at noon and just boom, 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 boom. Uh, you guys gave us that great uh, segment from Vegas. Yeah, that was that, a good one. That was that was that was fantastic, and we we rolled. It was fantastic. Listen, there's there's always sports news. You just gotta find it. You just gotta find it, or it just falls in your lap, or it just you just your your favorite football team just signs five guys in one week, and it makes the the show very easy. But I'm glad you guys are back from the trip. I am. I'm glad you guys. Uh, Looks like you got a little bit of sun. Looks like you. It seems like you guys had a good time. I'm just glad that that the the band's back together, the band the band's back together, and the van brought the van back together. And I'm, that's I'm, right. I'm glad you guys are back. There was there was a point on the way back home I thought we could die. Um, I mean I was dead serious. There was a few times I was just praying back in the back as I was trying to take a nap and sleep. That was our job. We were supposed to sleep while we were not driving. 
not very easy to do. One, there was social pressure uh, on the idea of that if you didn't get some sleep, you could be the one that failed us. Correct. Because uh, we wanted to be home so bad, we decided that we weren't going to play Payne's Valley, right? That's correct. And we also decided that we were just going to drive straight through, which we did. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever timed the amount of time it's taken for someone to get back via vehicle with two people in it from Phoenix, from Goodyear, basically, all the way to Hamilton, Ohio. Uh, but we did the fastest. I, I, I will, I'm going to say we have the world record until someone proves me otherwise. It was I, like 27 hours, to be fair. I was so broken Headlines down. Headlines next. I was so broken down when I got home Sunday. I don't know what day that was. Sunday. I, I went to bed. I, I got home at noon right around there. I, it was, by the way, brutal. I, I had another 40 minutes to my drive that from Hamilton. Uh, I had to stop halfway through because my eyes were getting a little broken down, starting to close a little bit. That's all right. I made it through. We powered through. We got home at noon. I slept from noon until 6 for the selection show. After the selection show, I went back to bed, and from 7 p.m. until, I want to say, noon the next day on Monday, I was asleep again. I was so broken that my, my parents, I think they had to come up and check on me a couple times because they thought I was dead. Outside of that, the, I, I, I would say this. If you're planning on going for a drive that's longer than a whole day consecutively, 24 hours, and I did shout out to us, we did 28 I would, I would get at least three people in the rotation. Trace and I had a good thing going with four hours. If, we, if you go four, 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 shout up Lake Maislin, if you, go that, if you go that route, you have a chance. But a third person there, it would have given you an extra little time to, you won't sleep, you'll never sleep, but you can close your eyes and, I don't know, rest, I guess is the word you, you kept using. Yeah. So if we rested enough, we could just keep going. Towards the end of the trip, though, I was done. The last two hours was brutal. Brutal. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, all right, <clears throat> this is a very serious sports talk show. It always is. I don't want to ruin the 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 basically the built up seriousness that that uh, Reed and Lindsay and Casey brought to the show on a daily basis for the last two weeks. But Elliot, you have some headlines. Yeah, I've got a little bit here. I've got a little bit. So we'll start with something you already said. But Blake Snell and the Giants, two year deal, sixty two million dollars. Uh, there is an opt-out after the first season, which I would bet my life that he takes. But it seems like the Boris clients, and I guess Boris himself, may be washed. Getting worse deals by the day. So shout out to Blake Snell. He waited up until pretty much opening day to sign a deal that he probably could have signed uh, two months ago. Free agent offensive tackle Trent Brown, which I believe we will talk about today. He is in town. He's in Cincinnati today uh, meeting with the Cincinnati Bengals, maybe to replace Jonah. We'll see what happens there. Casey, I sent you a clip with Anthony Edwards, I believe, on Twitter or on X.com, whatever the hell it is. Anthony Edwards yesterday threw down maybe the best dunk of all time uh, with this absolutely insane posterization. Timberwolves win this 114-104. But here we go. Anthony Edwards going to get the pass right there, and he throws it down from almost the free throw line. You I consider that a dunk? That's a dunk. Was it Drew Garrison saying that wasn't a dunk on Twitter? I don't know. I think it's a great debate. I think that's a because that's what that's what that's that's always what uh, Blake Griffin would do. He'd throw it in opposed to actually dunk it in. Right. And I think that's a dunk. Reed, do you think it's a dunk? Yes. Lindsay. Yeah. Casey. Uh, I'll say it's a dunk. Mm. I'm gonna go with it's not a dunk. That was the big debate when Dwight Howard won the the dunk contest by throwing it in, right? Yeah. Or not Dwight Howard. It was Blake was Griffin. It? Blake Griffin. And it was like, was it a gr- was it a dunk? Was it a dunk? Sure. I think it counts as a dunk. I don't think your hand has to touch the rim. Yeah, it's a motion. It's the motion. Right. Uh, if it looks cool, that's what it was. Other than that, the Reds, they lose 4-2 to two to the Giants. And I'm sure we're going to get into this. Jake Fraley had to leave the game early after fouling a ball off himself. Montas looked good, though. Four innings, one run, f- striking out five. Uh, so shout out to the Reds. They lose another one. They lose another player, which is, just seems like we talked about the depth about a month ago. Running out of depth. Running out of depth quickly. So we'll see, we'll see what happens on opening day, but I am concerned right now. Uh, Xavier, their season is not over. They travel to Georgia tonight for the first round of the NIT. UC will take on San Francisco at 9 p.m. tomorrow right here in Cincinnati for their first round game in the NIT. The NIT, back with a vengeance. By the way, uh, and I, I, I put this on one of our topics because I thought it was interesting. Uh, Indiana, St. John's, Memphis, Syracuse, Mississippi, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma, they all opted out of this tournament. 
And I think it sparked a debate, and I have a, I have a little video here from uh, Tom Crean that I'm going to play in a second. I, I, as a fan of a team that hasn't made the tournament in quite some time, I don't hate the NIT. I really don't. I, I, obviously, it's, it's lesser than the, the, big, the big tournament, the, the dance, as it's called. But it's still extra basketball. It's still postseason basketball. I'm not going to get upset because my team plays in it, nor am I going to be upset if my team wins it. Uh, I, I don't think it's – it's obviously not as big of a tournament, but I think if you go and you play it and you have some fun, nobody's going to complain. You know how electric it would be if Xavier and UC played in the championship of this? It would be the greatest basketball game ever watched if we play in the, in the NIT championship game because really it's not even about winning the NIT at that point. Now it's just uh, you get an extra crosstown shootout. Um, I don't know where they'd play that. Hinkle. Neutral, huh? Hinkle Fieldhouse. Hinkle? Yeah, they played at Hinkle Fieldhouse, so it would be in Indianapolis. That would be, that would be – I might have to go to that. If, if that if that were to happen, so yeah, I but I agree I would agree with Crean here. Crean got real fired up on ESPN the other day uh, on Selection Sunday and, and basically called out everybody who didn't want to play any 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 of, any of these programs that didn't want to play any of these coaches who didn't want to participate. He called them out, and this is uh, this is Tom Crean. Uh, there's no question about it. I would want to coach. I would want to develop my team. Uh, you've got bigger staffs than you've ever had. There's plenty of time for the portal. There's plenty of time to talk to recruits. There's plenty of time to negotiate NIL deals. There's not plenty of time to play. There's not plenty of time to get your players on the floor and give them a chance to get better. There's not plenty of time for guys to continue to play that may never get to play again. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is absolutely ridiculous. It's each coach's choice. I get it. But if you take away a chance to play the games, to put your team on the floor, mm -hmm. let them opt out. All right, the bowl season has it all the time. Let it happen. Who cares? Give your players and coaches a chance to keep coaching and playing, wow. and don't shortchange. If a guy doesn't want to play, go sit down. If a coach doesn't want to coach, go recruit. But there's got to be enough people to put five, six, seven people on the floor and go play. Makes absolutely zero sense to me. Yeah, and I kind of agree with him. So I, I – I don't understand why you wouldn't, especially if you're a guy like Wes Miller. I'm not saying he's coaching for his job next year, but there's certainly going to be more pressure on him than ever to get to that tournament. I don't see there's anything wrong with giving Day Day Thomas, getting Jizzle James a couple extra games here uh, just for practice sake, just to, just to get everybody fired up for next year. So I, I agree with him. I think teams that opt out, kind of soft. Uh, I would like to make a note. Seven years ago, uh, Indiana did not make the tournament, and uh, they declined the opportunity to play a home game in the NIT because they didn't want to, quote, devalue their court. Um, the head coach of that team, Tom Crean. So, yeah, I mean, it's really nice to sit up at the, up at the desk now and, and say what you say, but the truth is that there are some programs that, quite frankly, if, they're, if, it's, if it's a disappointment, they don't make the tournament – they feel like their time is better used elsewhere and they, and they want to move on and, and try to build their roster to make the tournament the next year. You can make the case of the argument to what he said. Hey, if you don't want to play and you don't want to coach, that's fine. Don't play, don't coach. Have somebody else coach. Have a, an assistant do this or do that. Uh, that would be a unique way of going about it. Maybe it's the right way of going about it. But nonetheless, I can see the, the, the reason as to why both sides would be fair. Um, yes... I do think that there's something to the idea if you're a senior that you would like to have an opportunity to play some more. But the whole notion um, that you have extra practice time, this, that, and the other, uh, UC is in a spot where they've not made the tournament in quite some time. I think the very, very clear argument you can make about UC and Xavier is that they're probably going to have to dip into the portal to be able to become a team that they feel like they want to be. Uh, I don't know if they're – and, and at this point in college basketball, can we, can we at least bring up something else really, really fast? Why is the portal open before the tournament? Like, that's, can we just use our logical brains one time from an NCAA institution standpoint? The portal already is a mess, but now the portal is open before the tournament starts. So you have all of these kids that are entering their names into the portal. You have coaches that are playing in the tournament that, quite frankly, it's probably still within their best interest as a – as an organization and a program to try to reach out to some of these kids that just put their name in the portal. But meanwhile, they're trying to play the biggest game of their season a week later. Like the NCAA puts some of these coaches and again, I'm not trying to, to, to say that the, the coaches have this unbelievably difficult job, et cetera, et cetera. But it just, I don't, I guess my question is, is why? 
why can't you just wait until the season's over and then you enter yourself into the portal? And maybe it has something to do with the way that the, the enrollment goes in school, this, that, and the other. But at this point, we're, we're, we're so much closer to professional athletics and college basketball than we, than we are of amateur athletics that I'm wondering when they're just going to hit the switch and say, yeah, the student athlete thing is cute, but let's face it. A lot of these student athletes really aren't student athletes. And I know that people think that may be a hot take. They have, I'm telling you right now, at these big institutions, the only way to fail class is to literally not even care. You have tutors on top of tutors on top of tutors that are going to help you pass classes. And I, I'm not suggesting that they're, that, they're, that they're not learning anything at all. I'm just suggesting that I don't want to hear the excuse as to why the portal opens up before the tournament starts because of some kind of school reason. Because at this point, college athletics are closer, again, to, to this guy's just going to get paid and he's a professional athlete than they are of just the traditional amateur student athlete. And NCAA, I know I'm already going to get to see it. I'm going to watch this plethora of commercials the NCAA is going to run that there's a there's a 500 million student athletes this year and only one percent of them are going to go pro it's like okay well they're in a professional organization already they're playing in a tournament that's getting seen by billions of people that are that that are that are warranting billion dollar contracts it is a big business to sit here and act like it's just you know uh, me and me and Reed going to the old sand volleyball game later today is what they try to make you believe it's supposed to be, but it's not. All right, um, Reds news. Obviously, we have that here in a minute. I want to get into something about uh, the whole tournament. I told you just a minute ago about how I used to just fall in love with the tournament. I used to try to watch every single game. I think, and I guess I'm asking for help in the room, I think gambling has, has waned my love for brackets. For some way, some reason, I'm not as excited this year. Maybe it's because of the two-week trip. Maybe that's some of it. Maybe it's like I'm just tired to a certain extent. Now, I'm making this isn't me whining by any stretch of the imagination. I'm very thankful that I got to go on the trip. It was it was a great time. But but again, maybe that's part of the reason as to why there wasn't as much of a ramp up or a build up to the tournament. So that's why. But I think gambling is the main reason as to why brackets, people doing brackets or having bracket pools, are down. Do you think that the amount of brackets that are filled out from a monetary standpoint, maybe it's the local firefighter bracket, or maybe it's the local, um, you know, name some big corporation's bracket pool. Do you think gambling has affected that to where now you just don't feel like playing anymore? Yeah, a little bit. I, I and I was at when I was a high schooler, I would be in probably 15 brackets, each one for 10 bucks, five bucks. And you're just trying to make a little bit of money. And I think that that was really what gambling was for me. Might have started my love for gambling. Uh, I, I absolutely love filling up brackets, and I still love it. I, I filled them out. I filled a couple out yesterday. Going to fill out a couple more today. Uh, but 100%, if, if, you're, if you're an avid sports better, you're just talking about the lines. You're, you're not talking about brackets, and that's, and that's just the way it is. I, I, unless, it's, unless somebody else disagrees with me in here, which is fine if they do. But when I woke up, the first thing I checked uh, from my 24-hour slumber was what's the spread of Nevada Dayton? It wasn't let's fill out Nevada over Dayton in my bracket. So I agree with you 100%. Mr. Mo brings up a fair point. He said that sports gambling ruins the love for sports. No, um, I don't I disagree. Okay, that's that you you can disagree. I think that there's some truth in that. I think that there's some validity in the idea of just being able to sit down and relax and watch sports. I did that for the players this weekend and I know that uh, listen, I'm not naive here. We'll talk NFL later, but but for the, for, for, if you will, just spare me maybe two minutes of golf talk here. Um, but I watched the players this weekend, and it was very compelling. It came right down to the end. There was great players in the mix, and I didn't have a, a you know, a dog in the race or whatever the term goes, and I, a uh, dog in the fight. I was just watching it purely as a spectator. And there was something about watching that that it was just nice. I didn't, I wasn't rooting for anything. I didn't have like money. Like I said, either money wasn't affecting my judgment. And I thought to myself, man, obviously I enjoy gambling. And gambling, if you do it responsibly, I think is a, is a very fine thing to do. It's entertaining, if nothing else. But I do think it affects your, your fandom. I think that it'll affect the way you view things. Um, now, it's impossible for me to say that I'm not going to gamble on March Madness. But 
part of me wants to do that, not gamble. Gambling is a double-edged sword when it comes to sports because it makes you sit down and watch more sports. Like if you if you gamble a lot, you will all of a sudden to where you're not caring about action, football midweek, college football. You're gonna sit down and you're gonna watch it. You're gonna learn players because of it. You're gonna watch Pac-12 basketball because it's 10 p.m. or you're gonna watch Mountain West basketball because it's 10 p.m. You're gonna throw a little money on Utah State and you're watching. You're gonna learn some players and you're gonna learn how a, a team style is and everything like that. But also, it does warp your brain into how you discuss said teams. It does warp your brain into your opinion of the team based on what the lines are, based on how they performed when you bet them. I mean, how many people have have you heard get into sports gambling? They bet on, you know, the the Seahawks, and the Seahawks don't cover the spread, and they're like, the Seahawks are the worst team ever. How many how many times have you heard that? So, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. It does make you watch sports. It does make you care about sports that otherwise you wouldn't care about, but then it warps your brain into where you can't have casual conversations anymore about, like, hey – this team has this guy. I wonder how it's going to affect. Now you're thinking, hey, this team's going to have this guy. Uh, are they going to hit their win total now? And stuff like that. Uh, we do have the bracket pool. It is already pinned inside the chat. If you want to uh, participate in that, please do so. I think that Sean mentioned that we were going to put give away uh, at least a hoodie and a T-shirt. We'll give away some merch to the winner. Um, free to enter, as always. So take us up on that. If nothing else, you have bragging rights in the chat, which is probably more valuable than maybe maybe the hoodies, although the hoodies are very, very nice. Um, all right, moving forward. Red's injury concerns. I think at this point I've come to the, the grips. I went out, we went out there, we were in spring training, and, and, I, and I thought of thinking to myself, and maybe, maybe you could argue I don't love baseball. Maybe that is it. I don't know. And, I, and, and sometimes maybe that my, my head gets warped in thinking that I don't love it maybe as much as others. And, and certainly, for a guy that, that, quite frankly, towards the end of my playing career, I was burned out. I mean, I g genuinely, the term burned out is exactly where I was uh, with baseball because I spent my literally my entire life, every single summer of my entire childhood, every single <clears throat> spring of my entire childhood was dedicated to one sport, and that was it. I was at the ball fields every single day. I uh, grew up, uh, you, you, you as well, grew up um, as mm -hmm. uh, a coach's son. And when you're a coach's son, there's, there's genuinely not that's, – that's your life. Um, so maybe that's part of it. You know, you get out of it and you're like, yeah, I just I, – I don't maybe want to be my notice to the grindstone of this very said sport every single day. But when I got to Arizona, I thought to myself when I was watching these games, and, and, and I think where, where maybe someone's opinion that it's super, super important and where Elliot's opinion is somewhere in the middle is the, the, the appropriate place because Elliot thinks it's just a vacation. And I've been trying to convince him over the trip. It's not just a vacation for these guys. They care more. I think they care more than just playing golf while they're out there. But spring training is like, at this point, if you can't put any stock in Jamier, uh, Jamier Candelario hitting 074 until yesterday or a guy like Stuart Fairchild hitting 700 with an OPS of, you know, damn near 2,000. Uh, if you can't put stock in that, then I guess my question is, is what is the actual point here? Is it genuinely just to get a few at-bats here and there and make yourself feel like you're ready to go, and then once the regular season starts, you ramp yourself up? Or is it to where it's, again, you just try to avoid injury, and if you avoid injury, that's good to go, or, or, or do you want guys to perform well in spring training? In that mixed bag of things, I don't know what the appropriate answer is, but the Reds have found themselves in a situation now to where they are, I think, being told that if you have even the slightest bit of an issue, you're not playing. That's the Reds' MO. That's the way they're going to handle spring training. And maybe that's the right way to go about it. I don't know. But I don't want to re uh, uh, reveal sources, but Matt McLean wanted to play and they told him he wasn't going to play. And next thing you know, X.com goes wild. Then you have a situation where on any other game of baseball, any other day of baseball, Jake Fraley walks around for three minutes, four minutes, gets back in the batter's box, and he continues to play baseball, and nobody acts like it was anything at all. Yet, he comes out of the game. We all know what happened. He fouled a ball in a spot that obviously doesn't feel all that well, and he needed some time. But you know what? The Reds, and I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but the Reds are so overly optim or are cautious that they just pull guys out no matter what. And maybe that, again, to be clear, is the right thing to do. But what it does create is this 
uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it does create this like weird phenomenon that guys are just getting hurt left and right. And I don't believe that's the case. I don't think that they're getting hurt. I think that they're like, hey, uh, Nick, why are you walking like that? Or to be honest, to your point, Elliot, these guys might know the organization's the organizational belief system and they just want a day off. Does Nick Martinez like wake up one morning and just like, yeah, I've been doing this long. I've been doing this a long time. Mm -hmm. I really don't feel like going out to the yard today and throwing. I just want a day off. I'm going to walk up there and I'm going to tell those guys, hey, I got like, my ribs are kind of bothering me today. What do you think I should do, coach? You think I should go or not? And they know what the Reds answer is going to be. And the Reds answer is now you take the day off. Am I overvaluing that? Am I simplifying it too much, Elliot? Or do you think that at this point, you think it's a glorified vacation? I think it's a vacation. And, and to be quite honest, I don't. We're, there's such hypocrisy because when we do the World Baseball Classic, when, when there is something to play for, you're playing for your country, you're playing for whatever, and somebody gets hurt in that, everybody throws their arms up in the air and they say, why are you playing in it? It doesn't mean anything. But when we got, we got T.J. Friedel losing two months of his season – in a spring training game, nobody says boo. Well, everybody knows why you're playing it because it's spring training. I, I think spring training should be regarded as how people – the same way as how people view that World Baseball Classic and that people shouldn't be playing in it. You should be pitching if, – if you're a pitcher, you get your arm loose, you go two innings, you just, you're just warming up basically. You're just out there to play golf. And I think that's what a lot of those players, especially the, the bona fide roster guys, a, a guy like Condelario who is – playing for nothing in spring training. Like, some of these rookies are out there, like, trying to prove to the coaches, to the fans. They're out there playing for a little bit of pride. Condelario signed his contract. What the hell is he playing for? He's playing a bunch of scrubs in a, in a, in a bunch of games that don't matter. And, and we want to get upset at him that he's hitting 100? No, he's fine. He'll, he'll be fine once, once the regular season starts coming around. And if he's not fine, it's not because spring training – there was no warning signs in spring training. He's not playing uh, elite major league pitching every single night. So I, I, I think people are, are putting too much stock into some of this. I, at this point, especially right now, as the Reds are nearing a season, we've lost our center fielder for two months, I'd shut them all down. I'd shut them all down, and, and, and we'll, they can go. We can go have a golf tournament. They'll have their own little golf tournament out in the yard, and, and we'll let uh, Shen and Lin. Uh, I, he, I can, he can go out there, and he can pitch for the Reds. What a strike. That's it. Get, Elliot, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't you a pro Bengals playing guys in the preseason guy? Don't uh, you think the Bengals should play guys in the preseason? Yeah, because there aren't 30 of those games. There's four games. I was going to say the same thing. Well, yeah, thing. It's, like it's, it's a NFL month. NFL preseason is a month. Then. It's a month. It's which a is month. The, which is the exact same amount of, as, as baseball. So it just feels hypocritical. Like if, if, if when we get to August, we're saying all these Bengals guys should play, they should play, they should play a much more dangerous sport. Right, I would I would argue four four games in the NFL, you're more likely to get hurt than thirty games of baseball. Um, but yeah, it seems hypocritical to say these guys need to play preseason games. I also don't want Joe Burrow playing in every single game. Everybody knows that last game they don't nobody plays anyway. So then then you're you're taking those three games down to two games, uh, and, and then after that, yeah, I'd like to see Joe Burrow play a half. Uh, the only I'd like to see Joe Burrow play a half of of two spring training of, of two preseason games. If we've are, we we're, we're made we've made it past the halfway point here. Though. That's my point. If this was the first day of spring training, sure, have everybody go out there, play a couple games, play a week of spring training games, get get stretched, get loose, and then after that we'll deal with it. After that, but and, I, and Bengals practices too. They're they're not full on tackling them for the entire practice either. They're barely hitting in practice to try to avoid injury. You can't really do that in baseball. You either pitch or you don't pitch. Yeah, or listen, you hit or you don't hit. So it's hard you, to You got to get ready to play. And you could do that in a in an abbreviated stance. It doesn't have to be a, a month long, but spring training it, it it is what it is, right? You're trying to figure out like you've got hundreds of guys that are getting ready for a long season and it, and it takes time to to get loose. You got to realize what you got. I do think that it gets underblown um, how much they do look into success on the field and how much they don't. Like, yeah, you're right. Ellie De La Cruz is going to be day one starter. He's going to he's going to be starting shortstop for the Reds. But there's there's three four guys that are trying to make the squad. There's guys that are trying to make in AAA and AA, trying to move up and down. It is important, and, and, and I get what you're saying about you've got to be cautious. But at the end of the day. Spring training is there for one thing and one thing only when it comes to guys like us that, that talk about sports. It's there to shape whatever opinion we want. 
right? I agree. It's, I it, completely it's, agree with that. Spring, spring training is only there to shape your opinion. You, you, you never change your opinion based on spring training, right? When, when Jamer Candelario is struggling, it's just he'll be fine, right? He's, he's a professional hitter. But if you got a guy like you're, you're a Stuart Fairchild guy and, he, and he's knocking the cover off the ball, you can just go, look how great Stuart Fairchild is. Even better, when you're a guy like me that ke- keeps trying to tell people, hey, this Pirates team's pretty good. Well, yeah. In their, the their, their leading spring training and home runs, and O'Neill Cruz has seven home runs, eight home runs. You can go and, like, see, I told you the Pirates are going to be pretty good. At the end of the day, it's all just cannon fodder. It's all just mist. It's all just, you know, gobbledygook. It doesn't matter, but, but it's, it's, it's there to shape your opinion. That's all it's there for for guys like us. I completely agree. And I think that uh, the, the one thing, and I get TJ Friedel's comment when he said that he, that he, wouldn't, he, he couldn't turn it off. When he plays baseball, he plays one way and he plays hard. I get that concept. Uh, there were a few times during, during the spring, though, when, when guys were stealing bags and diving headfirst into bases, and Will Benson's the same concept. It's like, I, I don't, there's, there's part of me that thinks like, hey, you, you, I, I understand the idea of turning the light switch on and turning it off and you can't play any other way, but there's, there's being smart and there's being reckless. And I'm not suggesting that TJ Friedel's being reckless. I don't want to make it sound like that, but I would like a guy that is that, is, that, is, that, is that important to our team Quite honestly, not diving for balls in the middle of spring training games, and he did it when we were out there too. To, but that's, his, to but, his credit, I understand that. But 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 my point is, is like you, you kind of have to understand the risk reward here. But if you if you don't want him diving for balls during, if you don't want him going hundred percent, he shouldn't be out there. And that's my point, is that people want th- them to just walk around out there and, and not really care about what's happening. Uh, and that's not how you play. You, you, no one's wired that way. When you're when you're playing a game, whether it's spring training or not. You're going to be playing the game. You're, you're trying your best. You're trying to win. You can't tell a guy out there, do everything you would normally do except for, like, try. Yeah, I you, mean, you I agree. You, it's impossible. You can't do it. And that's why I say if you're going to be worried about that, then don't have them play at all. And we'll just take spring training and everybody will go get their 8 a.m. tea times. Well, I see. The, I think that there's a way to, 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 to find yourself in the middle of that. I don't but think there's a middle of that. I think that there is, but that's fair. That's fair. Uh, one thing I want to push back on really quickly about the whole NFL, uh, MLB analogy is that, you know, if Major League Baseball's wins and losses, they're, they're 10 times less valuable. So it, it, in regards to winning. So at the beginning of the season, you know, if you lose a game in the NFL – that's 10 times more valuable than a winning or losing game in MLB. There's 162 games or 17 games. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it's, what's, what's crazy is, is their seasons are about the same length. Like, it's, if, it's just uh, imagine if a baseball team, you play your week, you play your seven, six games in a week, and if you came out on top, like if you won four out of six, you just get one. But that's how it is. But you're right. It's it's about yeah. It's it's nine. I wonder times if the, and again, this is a ridiculous thing to think about. But I, I wonder if the NFL, if they had a 162 game season, which we all know is unrealistic, not possible, but in a fake make believe world, let's think they're about they're going to go to 18 second. games here soon. But if they did, if they did play 162 games, if guys are already not playing in the regular season, think about how laughable it would be to try to can try to suggest that they would play in a preseason. And I get that that the sports in a way are much different in regards to danger. However, the way that sports injuries keep occurring in Major League Baseball, I, I'm not saying that it's the same. I'm not saying it's the same in regards to the actual uh, level of the ability to get hurt, but maybe a guy going out with a shoulder injury for two months is the same as a guy getting a stinger or something like that and misses a week or two. The NFL is interesting with their preseason because there's, there's teams that do it different ways that are very successful. Like the Chiefs, in the Ravens, they go all out when it comes to their preseason games. Like they, they hit hard. They have long training camps. They, they go play every single game like it matters. And obviously we know how successful the Chiefs are and the Ravens too. Then there's teams like the Bengals, the 49ers, the Rams, who don't play any of their guys. They just show up to week one and go like, hey, this is our guys. This is how we're going to play. And they're very successful too. So it's, it, it is interesting in the NFL. There's not a perfect way to do this. Um, but I guess my point, I know that – that maybe I'm being naive here. Um, Maybe I'm being too overly optimistic. I do genuinely believe the Reds don't have that many injury issues as it's made out to believe because of the way in which they handle all of the situations that happen in spring training. I think they shut guys down immediately. Maybe that's the right thing to do. I don't know, but they do that. Matt McClain, if, if this was the regular season, would have played the other day, 100%. 
Andrew Abbott has shoulder soreness. Or excuse me, not Andrew Abbott. Brandon Williamson. Which leads me into the next topic of conversation here before we get into some NFL talk. Is that if Brandon Williamson isn't viewed upon, in my opinion, the same as Andrew Abbott, the question I have is, what are we doing? Why? Is it just because Andrew Abbott had a good run at the beginning of his starts and in, in, in perception is reality or first impressions matter? Because it seems like we just gloss over the back half of what Andrew Abbott did. We also decide that, okay, well, maybe Andrew Abbott was just tired. And all of those things can be very, very true. But how come Andrew Abbott gets a little bit of a pass, but, but Brandon Williamson doesn't? Somehow now it's this whole, is it Andrew Abbott or is it Brandon Williamson? And you're going to hear people that obviously follow this club that are going to say, how in the world could you possibly leave Andrew Abbott off the starting rotation? Well, he hasn't thrown the ball that well this spring. And again, I know it's spring training. But I do think spring training is good for one thing. It's good for guys that are on the back end of their careers. And I think it's good for guys that are on the front end of their careers. Because ultimately those guys are, they have something to play for. Josh Harrison had something to play for. Tony Kemp got hit straight in the face. He didn't come out of the game. If, if, if that was Matt McLean when we were there and, and Matt McLean got smoked in the face the way that Tony Kemp got smoked in the face, guess what? Matt McLean is not playing. But Tony Kemp is. Why? Because Tony Kemp has something to play for. He's trying to make yep. a team. That's the whole point of spring training, in my opinion, is it's the guys that are coming up, it's the guys that are going away. Can you stick around or do you belong? And I just wonder now, does it matter? I think it doesn't. I genuinely don't think it matters. I think that ultimately, over the course of 162 games, you're going to find out who you are, and you're going to find out you know, what you might have had if they would have maybe played more. But the reality is you're going to get to know what Andrew Abbott is, and you're going to get to know what Brandon Williamson is. And they're both going to have their time in the big leagues. And I, I think genuinely that none of us know which one's the better arm. I'm starting to become this Brandon Williamson stan largely because I feel like it seems to me that he's the odd man out when everybody talks about this Reds rotation, and I think that they've just politely forgot how good he was down the stretch, or better yet, how consistent he was. He was one of the very few guys in that rotation that actually showed up every fifth day to throw the ball. Now, whether or not that continues to be a thing, I don't know. But I'm not going to sit here and suggest that he's automatically out just because Andrew Abbott had one hell of a start to his major league career. We'll find out. And I don't know who the right choice is, but if I had to say, if I was in David Bell's shoes, I would go with Brandon Williamson. Because, again, I believe that availability is a big, big thing. And yeah, I get it that some will say, well, look at Luke Weaver. He threw the ball, and he was there every five days, and look how bad he was. And yeah, there's some merit to that. But again, it seems to be now, David Bell had come out yesterday and said that his four starters are the ones that we ultimately thought they were going to be, outside of maybe Nick Martinez was one of the ones that, Correct. at the beginning of the year, that I thought that David Bell was, was, was on. And that shows you maybe how concerned they are of the guys in which are in the rotation. I thought that Nick Martinez was slotted for the bullpen 100% by the way that David Bell talked. So Nick Martinez is going to take the fourth spot. The fifth spot's up to Andrew Abbott or Williamson. If you had to pick, which one would you take? I would, I would take Brandon Williamson. I, I'm on your side. I, Andrew Abbott, people remember how good he was when he first came up. Same thing a little bit with Alexis Diaz, I, I, I fear. Alexis Diaz was very good to start last season. Uh, he, he got on a groove. He became one of the best closers in the, in the National League. Towards the end of the year, fell apart. And Drabbit, without, without a question, without a shadow of a doubt, he fell apart towards the end of the year. He couldn't go five innings anymore. His arm was shot. I have concerns about that going into this year. And, and for that reason, I'm taking Brandon Williamson. And it seems like uh, ever since, shout out to our guy Charlie, sent the tweet out about him. On that rainy day in Baltimore, he, he's, been, he's been dynamite. Struggled at the beginning, started figuring it out towards the end. And, and I'll, take, I'll take the hottest guy up right now, which is Brandon Williamson. It's hard to believe who's healthy and who's not. I, I, that, that's the hardest thing with this Reds camp, because I don't know who's healthy and who's not. I really don't, because sometimes they're like, oh, this guy's got shoulder soreness. I have Nick Martinez has a misplaced rib. 
I have the list. Like, now all of a sudden, Mick Nick Martinez is thrown again. He's the fourth starter. But yeah, but last week it, I thought he like I thought he didn't have a rib. So here's the list as of right now. And this is according to our friend Bryce Spalding. Friedel out two months. Uh, Jabot forearm throwing bullpens likely delayed two to three weeks from opening day. We have Alex Young back back injury. Uh, no that's date on his return. That's yeah, that's fine. Sam Mole shoulder. Uh, expected to be ready opening day, so really nothing, nothing bad there. Nick Lodolo, his leg, he's progressing well. Expected return is April 10th. Brandon Williamson, shoulder, we have no update. Uh, no update on the return. Uh, we don't know anything really about it. Nick Martinez, as you just said, a rib. Uh, it's, it's something he's dealt with before. He is expected to be ready on opening day. Uh, and obviously we have Jake Fraley, which really isn't an injury at all last night. So those are your injuries heading into the opening day. Last night, you'd have thought Jake Fraley was out for the season. Correct. That, that's, that, that's where I'm at. It's like, he, how serious do we want to take this? At this point, I'm going to take none of it serious because I don't think that we're getting an ounce, an ounce of actual real injury news outside of TJ Friedel. When they come out and they tell you a guy's going to be out for an extended period of time, sure, obviously that's not good. Um, it seems, though, to stay on the injury news, TJ Friedel has opened up the door for Stuart Fairchild, which brings me to another quick point here. Uh, Stuart Fairchild is going to get his chance. He's going to get his chance. And I don't know whether that, that we like that or not. That's fine. I, I understand why some people would be disgusted by the idea that the Reds aren't going to go out and shop a little bit. Um, the Pirates got Taylor, Michael Taylor, and you'd like to think that that would have been a, that would have been a pretty good fit for the Cincinnati Reds, especially right. for a, what, I think it was $3 million price tag. Yeah. It wasn't very much. Um, but Stuart Ferris is going to get his chance, and that could go one of two ways. That could go the way in which maybe it went for a guy like Brandon Williamson, who overperformed, didn't expect him to play as well as he did or throw the ball as well as he did, but now Stuart Fairchild does play well. Or it could go the way in which some think it will, which is Stuart Fairchild is going to show why he's a platoon guy, and he's a you know what a quadruple-A player is what some would call him. He's yeah, I get think, his chance though. I think the bigger story is going to be Will Benson. I think Will Benson's going to take that job. That's I, fair. He, Will Benson's not going to take that job when they when when the, when the lefties are on the mound. To be fair though, true. So it'll be it'll be a platoon of of Stewie and Will Benson. But I think Will Benson. I'm not against that. The only concern I have is 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 Will Benson the way in which he looks when he goes and he plays outfield from time to time. He looks like a, basically a, a baby deer. Yeah, I mean, def- defensively, defensively, we're losing a lot. We're losing a ton. T.J. Friedel was, you could argue, was our best defender last year. So I, I'm not pleased about it. But I'd rather have the guy who I know can contribute offensively if you're not going to contribute defensively, and that's Will Benson. All right, fair enough. All right. Are, are, are we worried about the, the Reds' defense as a whole, losing two starters that were pretty good gloves and, and Marte and, and Friedel? Because it yeah. was a bad defense last year. It was, yeah, it was, yes. it was a bottom third. To answer your question, yeah, I, I, I don't see a ton of gold glove caliber uh, talent on this roster. So I, I am a little bit concerned. Ellie De La Cruz, I love Ellie De La Cruz. Love him, love him, love him. But let's not pretend he had some of the world's worst errors last year. He's a rookie. He was young. I get it. Uh, but, yeah, our, our, our shortstop's not the world's best uh, defender either. Matt McClain, I think, is as sure as they come at second base, but... If he's hurt, I am concerned there. So we don't know. I, I'm concerned if Ellie can't figure it out at shortstop. I've been I told agree. how great of a defensive shortstop Ellie is, and by all stretch of the imaginations, I think that his ceiling is incredibly high. Yes, his ceiling is unbelievably high, and I'm not going to sit here and, and, and be overly pessimistic about, about Ellie. His swing and miss rate is, is, is very alarming, though, for being honest. Um, I think that's fair to say. Do I, do, am I suggesting that he's going to be a bust? No, but I do think it's fair to say that his swing and miss rate is – it's high. I mean, it's right. not. This isn't just like, oh, you know, th- this happened last year. It's now happened this spring. He made a swing adjustment, as everybody else does in the in, in Major League Baseball during the off season. And again, his swing and miss rate still relatively high. And then on top of that, I was told how great he was defensively in last year. From from maybe, and again, I get there. You're going to start using some higher level analytics, and that's fine. You're going to say outs above replacement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but again, if he can't make the routine plays. I think that it's going to start to rear its head of whether or not how long are they going to stick with this guy, especially when they have a solution that they feel maybe more comfortable with. The basement, the floor is much, much higher with Matt McClain playing shortstop. So then what happens? I don't know. Maybe you move Ellie to third. They've talked about Jamie Condelario playing second base. Uh, Jonathan India certainly I don't think is going to play second base, but he did play second base in a spring training game. So I don't know. I don't know what the ultimate plan is. 
Reds defensively took two big hits, though. Nuelve Marte right. being suspended, and now your best outfielder, uh, defensively at least, uh, and TJ Friedel being out. But that's part of it. You know, that's the other thing, too, I want to make clear. is like, this isn't just like, oh, woe is me. This happens. This is Major League Baseball. You have to have depth. We talked about how great this infield depth was. Well, it's going to get tested. And Jamie Candelario has to be a right. It has to be a good signing if they want to compete. Like, they went out on a limb, and they took this guy. They could have gotten, they could have gotten uh, Matt Chapman for basically almost the same amount of money. So... They're either going to get praised or they're going to get hated for the decision they made with Jamie or Condelario, which somehow, oddly enough, almost now has become the X factor of whether or not this Reds team will, will get off to a good start or not. I think Jamie, I, I, yes, I know he's, he's struggling right now, but I, his, his entire career, his last six years in the league, he's been, a, he's been an above average hitter. He's, he, he's, as I've mentioned before, in a, in a lineup full of question marks, he seems like a definitive period. It might take, he's going to go through slumps as every hitter does, but he's going to be fine. Um, but yeah, going back to the defense thing, if we're worried about Ellie, then this this defense has a lot of problems. Because I'm, I'm I'm looking around the field, and I, I hope I'm saying this not as a Cubs fan, but like trying to be unbiased about this. You're looking at Jamer's not a good infielder. Jonathan India, I don't even think is viable to play. But even if he does, he's not a good infielder. Spencer Steer's not a good fielder. He's a terrible fielder. I don't know about C yet, but like around Tyler Stevenson's not a good fielder. Like this team that has had problems and, and has some, some guys. I don't know how good the strikeout stuff is for the pitchers, but in a small park, y- you get some leeway there. That defense isn't as important, but it's certainly with, with a staff that has a bunch of question marks, you would, you'd prefer some guys that have some definitive gloves behind it. So, yeah, it, it, it should be a, a big concern losing two very good gloves in Friedel and Marte. Right. Tyler Stevenson, we get the spring training that first night, immediately two errors or pass balls. Well, they're, 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 they're wild pitches. Wild That's pitches. That's the thing in Major League Baseball, though, that, that, that you know, it's tough. Stats are tough, uh, you know, and I, and I understand why there's this desire for having higher-level analytics because the scoring decisions on some of these are just astronomically hilarious. Uh, Josh Harrison made a play in the hole at third base. And in, in, in to Nick, listen, if it was Noel V. Marte that made the throw, it would have been the world's best throw, and it was right on time. But since it was Josh <laughs> Harrison, he decided to slander the man. But nonetheless, he backhanded the ball. He made a play in the hole, in my opinion. He threw the ball. It got there in plenty of time, by the way. Yes, it might have been rolling by the time it got to CES, but CES botched it, wasn't able to catch basically what was a ground ball, and all of a sudden now it's a hit. So some of these scoring decisions, I just scratch my head, and I wonder what, what exactly – is going on up there but i digress all right um we have some ad reads to get to and then we have some nfl talk and i'm sure along the way maybe the trip will pop up here and there and maybe some funny stories that's next but at first casey mccallister as always has to pay the bills yeah, that's right. The Future Bengals Report is brought to you by Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data-centered world with a suite of services, from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work-from-home computing modules to improve efficiency and... Productivity. Productivity, that's right. Visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. And let me tell you about... Pawnee Water, made right here in Hamilton, Ohio, uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that other brands use. The result, healthy alkaline water, and some say the best tasting water in the world. Visit Pawnee Water at P-A-H-H-N-I water.com to see where you can buy this great tasting water. And let me tell you about our new sponsor, the Game Time app. Uh, your ticketing app uh, for Chatterbox Sports. I used it all the time last year. Anytime I needed to go to a Reds game right after the, uh, the work day here at the office or just, you know, a workman special, I'd use Game Time app. It has all the pricing up front. It's two clicks. You get your tickets. You get to see exactly where you're sitting. It's the best app out there for you when you need to get a ticket quick. So download the Game Time app. Use code OTB. That's code OTB. Terms apply for $20 off your first purchase. Again, download the Game Time app. Use code OTB, $20 off your first purchase. How about that, Casey? Uh, yeah. We've been doing this thing while you guys are, have been gone, <laughs> where we, we, we figure out what's going on in the world, according yeah. to a, a, a college-age female. Kate Middleton was, was spotted yesterday, <laughs> Lindsay? Yeah. She, apparently. Do you, do you have that picture, Casey? It's... 
There was a clip of her like walking around or whatever. I, You're not buying it though. No, because it looks nothing like her. And uh, someone else on Twitter like unblurred her face, and it's not her. So like, are you concerned about Kate Middleton's well-being at this at this moment? Yeah, because they act like they can't take a picture of her when. Remember when, like, Charles came out of the hospital looking really scary? Do you remember that famous mm-hmm. picture of him? They can get that picture, but they can't get any picture of Kate Middleton. What's, what's, it, what's interesting is, you know, there's, there's pictures and videos of her walking out of the hospital after delivering a child in, in, in four-inch heels, <laughs> and she can't come out to do a public a- appearance right now. I'm worried about Kate Middleton, Lindsay. And then when she or she AI that picture of herself to, like, show proof that she was okay, but it was not even real. It wasn't that real. itself wasn't real, so. Is this it up there? Can you see that? Yeah. So that's the photo? All right, I'm going to – and then there's apparently right, a video yeah. as well. So wow. that, yeah, what's, the, like, what's the red swiggly line, please? I guess that's supposed to show that she's – Oh, she got taller. She got taller, taller, shorter. Her height changed is what I oh. think I'm saying. Well, sometimes the ground's not level. I think they're walking her head is also tilted down on the other photo. I don't know if that's – I have a seat to your question. very much up in the air, obviously. What did, what did they why, do? Why do Americans uh, – why does anyone in the world care about the royal family? That's a god. I mean, I know that, that that might seem like a bit. That might. But I genuinely. I've always wondered this. I've, I I even asked the question. I think when the when the when the, um, I, and again my royal family uh, history of knowledge. When who was the one that actually just decided they were going to leave the royal family? Meghan Markle. Uh, Meghan Markle. Why was that such a big deal? Why Why did people care? Listen, Meghan Markle leaving the royal family. Explain they are, like they, I'm are five, they are they are they are mascots. They are literally mascots for an entire nation. They have they have no power, very little power. They just spend the company, they spend the country's money, and do uh, do public public photo shoots and all this stuff. And uh, it would be like Meghan Markle leaving the royal family would be like Rosie Red saying, "I don't want to do this anymore," and we don't get to see Rosie Red anymore. Wow, that's what it'd be like. Can you imagine what this yeah, would be going I, I, through if we I, lost I, Rosie? What a terrible Red? world that would be. I'm gonna be very careful here. That seems like a trap. That was a trap. Reed just laid a trap right there in the front of us, Elliot, and you can fall right for it if you'd like. You can you can go for the cheese, but I'm I not. I am listen. not falling for that trap that you just laid right in front of. As me. a mouse, I don't lay out traps. Yeah, we you stay do. away from traps. You clearly that just laid a trap. trap out there for me to say something derogatory towards Rosie Red, and I'm not going to do it. Although it was at the tip of my tongue, and I decided to bite it. You have something to say? I think the Reds rig those races in Rosie Red's favor. I one hundred percent. I think Rosie Red. Uh, again, this is this is from Elliot. Do do you think that Rosie Red can't win an athletic competition because she's female? Uh, I think are, that's what he's saying. Yeah, that's not. I don't think that's what I'm saying. I first of all, I don't think they have gender. Why would? Second why would of all, it, she's she's clearly a female. Um, clearly, yeah. You you're sure? gonna die on that hill. <laughs> I'm that not Rosie, dying on that, that hill. Rosie Red. Yeah, I could probably pull up her biography and they say her and stuff like that. So yeah, her her, her identity is probably female. But why do you think that she can't win a race? I think she can win a race. I think they rig it, though. I think Mr. Red has been told to, maybe by some of the mob bosses in the area, been told to, hey, we're going to let Rosie win a couple here, and we'll give you, like, once every Thursday, maybe. The first thing that pulls up in Rosie Red's bio is, Rosie Red is a female mascot for the Cincinnati Reds. Love that. There you go. So there, that's the end of that. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that. That was written by Big Mascot, but I, I, I'm not. No, I think Rosie Red eventually will get back on the track. And, and speaking of the Royals, uh, I think that story's nonsense. But the rest of it, kind of wild. Lindsay, how, how, how um, entranced are you going to be in this journey to figure out if uh, is it Kate's her name? Is that right? Kate. Kate Middleton. Kate Middleton is okay or not? Um, how I mean, many hours a day are we spending on this? I'm really not. not, not nothing. I just I'm not I started any time. this. Dick. It's just on Twitter. When I'm like going on Twitter, gotcha. it, my Twitter feed's it, filled with it, but I'm not like seeking it out. It um, started out. Were, she wanted to tell us about Love Is Blind, and I was got like, it. "All right, give us the four one one, sister. What what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing?" <laughs> Love well, I asked her when I walked in if she did anything outside of just lay, in, lay on the beach, and, 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 or did she just go to a tanning booth the entire time she was down there? I did not go to a tanning booth. This is natural. Natural. And all natural. Interesting. Well, good for you. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Uh, fun, the most, uh, did you already get to ask this, maybe the most fun thing that you did down there? Um, my favorite animal is a dolphin. So when we went on the boat ride, uh, dolphins like followed the boat and jumped up in the air and was like chasing Sweet. the jet. And so I got to see dolphins. So nice. that was probably my favorite thing. Nice. nice. Did, you li- did, you, did you like Tua? Did you think Tua was a good quarterback? <laughs> I don't really care about Tua. but. No. <laughs> you said you liked the dolphins. I was curious. All right. Um, the NFL. 
It was, it's, it runs, it literally runs the world. I don't know, I don't, I don't know how else to say it. Like, the thing is, is that when you're in a clicks business, sometimes you, you're like, should we talk about this or should we not talk about this? Well, then you look at the numbers and like, that's the only thing everyone seems to want to care about. Outside of Connor, the Connor gate, um, basically the NFL seems to be the thing that most people are interested in. Connor gate, by the way, we'll get into that a whole nother day. I, I, I don't think I had the time, the energy, or uh, really, quite frankly, the, uh, I'm not far enough removed yet to talk about it. It's fair. Are you Elliot? Yeah, I'd, I'd rather never talk about it. But if we have to talk about it, I'll certainly talk about it. That was a tough. That was a tough day in Chatterbox Sports history. Um, but we move on. All right. So the NFL's in a spot now where they're going to garner all the attention as soon as soon as I would even argue this first two weekends is over for for March Madness because March Madness is this weird phenomenon where everyone's super super excited about it, and then you have the first what we call it, first four days of games, and then all of a sudden the field's cut in half, so then you're down to 30, uh, you're down to 32, and then obviously after the first weekend, you're down to the Sweet 16. It's like the Sweet 16 becomes far less interesting to the vast majority of viewers, and I would be interested to see the, what the ratings were as the, as the tourney progresses on. But it seems like the NFL has found themselves in a position where they have the most action in free agency, they then have a draft that everybody cares about, and then once the draft's over, everybody tries to figure out who had the best draft. And by that time, we get ourselves close enough to preseason to start talking about who we like. And then you actually have the regular season. They've figured out a way to dominate the sports landscape for almost, damn near, the whole entire year. And here's the thing about me that I am very genuinely concerned about when it comes to doing a sports talk show. Is that I'm relatively casual in the NFL. I, I, just, I can only have so many fandoms. I was trying to think of this on the way over here. Why do I not care as much about the NFL as what seems to be other people do? And I think the answer is, is they don't watch 162 baseball games and they don't care about college football as much as I do. And they certainly don't watch college basketball nearly as maybe as much as I do. And at some point you just can't do it all. So I'm putting my hand up now and I'm just going to tell you flat out that I'm a casual when it comes to the NFL, which is bad because that is the thing that almost everybody else cares about. Well, don't but, I, but I do think... Really quickly, Casey, before I get inundated with all of these things that matter and all of these things that should take place and who's going to play right tackle for the Bengals and do they have this nose tackle and is he going to be any good, I do sit back sometimes and wonder if the casuals are the ones that can see through all of it. I am the one that did say Justin Fields wasn't very good at football after all. The other thing I'm going to say right now to Bengals fans is that, you know what, if Joe Burrow's healthy – and Joe Burrow plays the ability that he's capable of playing at. I think a lot of these things that we're talking about are null void. I think the delta, the difference between this nose tackle and that nose tackle that we're talking about right now is really not that great. We're not going out and getting an Aaron Donald by any stretch of the imagination. And the guy that you lost, yes, DJ Reader was really good. But my point is, is doesn't this all, and I guess I'm asking, convince me if I'm wrong, is this not all just come down to whether or not Joe Burrow's healthy and plays well? Well, yeah, I mean that's that's the yeah that's the. How much the gist of a percentage of would you say that is the that is the season of the Cincinnati Bengals? Probably like eighty five. But but I would say that the the team itself like you can't just have and I, I believe the Bills kind of proved this fact. I mean you can't just have Josh Allen because you you need a full team to be able to stop Mahomes. I mean you can't just have. Joe Burrow, you need a full team to be able to stop Patrick Mahomes. So, I mean, th those little differences end up mattering in the end, I think. The, the grand scheme of things and the whole season as a whole, I don't think it matters, but it does when you get down to not cutting time. And that's what it, you know, boils down to. And I was just going to say before I almost interrupted you there that you, get, you don't need to worry about being casuals because you got AAA batter up here called up for the first time. Reed Mouse and me and him, we, we, we run the NFL landscape here at Chatterbox. Oh, we run it. That was, that yeah. was awesome, Casey. That, yeah. was, that was incredible. Here's the thing about um, – I'll touch on all the things you said. First off, the reason that you're not as big into the NFL is the thing that the NFL has over other sports is the community centered around a team. And when you root for a team outside of this community – it's hard to feel a part of that unless you're like a Cowboys fan that has a big enough community. And the Packers have that. And I, I know your family has created this nice little community for it. But it's, it is so community-driven that it's, 
it, it, it supersedes all other leagues. It makes all other leagues feel regional, makes all other leagues feel small. Um, as for what you said about Joe Burrow, that was the point I made yesterday. Last week on Wednesday afternoon, after the Mike Gusecki signing, after the Sheldon Rankin signing, after the um, Geno Stone and Von Bell signing, you, t- you looked on Twitter, you looked on X.com, Mr. Elon Musk's side business. That's right. And you saw, let Duke cook. How great are the Reds? Man, this team can't, can do no wrong. And then that afternoon, DJ Reader goes and signs with the Detroit Lions. And then just the next day, the group think starts back up, right? It goes from, let Duke cook. This team's incredible, yada, 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 to, man, this whole thing is falling apart. It's unraveling before our eyes. What are we doing? This is, the, this is a disastrous offseason. And I wanted to say yesterday, I was like, hey, let's, let's pump the brakes. A, a wise philosopher, his name is, is Sir Boy Wonder 513 called into the show last week and said, what are we talking about, guys? All that matters is, can Joe Burrow be healthy? Can we protect Joe Burrow? Which is interesting because that is true. And we are so focused on hey, how can we replace DJ Reader? We, we, we've got to figure out how to stop the run game. We've got to do all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it takes this one pivot, right? you got the basketball. You, you plant that foot and you're pivoting around. What can we do now? Where, where's the next move? And the next move is maybe it was the move from the get-go is how do we keep Joe Burrow upright? And that's what the Bengals are looking at today. How can we get a right tackle in to replace Jonah Williams? That right tackle position has been a revolving door. Riley Reef, Lyell Collins, Jonah Williams, and now it's looking like if the Bengals can get something done with, with Trent Brown today, that's going to be the next move. And I've said for the longest time, or, and, and by the longest time I mean two weeks, exactly two weeks, that's the longest time, it's a fortnight, that I want there to be a definitive answer there. I want there to be a long-term answer there. And I want them to draft somebody. I believe the Bengals can do both. I think that you can get Trent Brown, who is a former Pro Bowl. He's kind of floated around. He's not as what we once thought of him as a tackle, but he's still a veteran. He's going to get the job done to some extent. And you can draft a guy to be the future. Because as we know, out of, out of all the positions in the NFL, quarterback's the hardest, has the, lar- has the largest bell curve, right? Has the largest learning curve. Tackle is probably the second. It takes a year for a tackle to get underneath. Very rarely do you see a guy come into the league and be an outstanding tackle from the get-go. So there's going to be a bell curve. There's going to be a learning curve with whoever we put at right tackle. Trent Brown can be the stopgap. Maybe the plan all along was let's not worry about who we got at nose tackle. Let's worry about how this offense can score points and be the full offense that we think the Cincinnati Bengals can be. Maybe the answer always was, how can we keep Joe Burrow healthy? Because there's few quarterbacks in this league that can can transcend a roster. We're talking guys like Patrick Mahomes all last year. We're talking how bad is this Chiefs team? They win the Super Bowl. We're talking the Bills. How bad is this Bills team? Well, Josh Allen turns it on late. And we're going to see how good he can be with his entire defense walking out the door. I think Joe Burrow is another one of those guys that can transcend a roster, that can elevate a roster, that at the end of the day, if you've got nine upright, it's pretty hard to beat the Cincinnati Bengals. So that's where the pivot is right now, is it's going from, hey, I know we had a a, a 30th ranked defense, but we still bring back a lot of pieces. If you look at how many snaps you're bringing back from last year to this year with the Cincinnati Bengals, it's a large majority. You're going to lose a nose tackle in DJ Reader, but for other than that, you're going to be bringing Sheldon Rankins. You're going to bring in Geno Stone. All the other starters are still there. Miles Murphy's probably going to play a little more than Sam Hubbard. Maybe let's just focus on, hey, let's keep this blonde boy that, that has taken us to a Super Bowl, has taken us to an AFC championship. Let's keep him upright, and that's what I think the Bengals are trying to do with Trent Brown. Yeah, Trent, not- Trent Brown's 100% going to sign with the Bengals, yes? I don't know. Not hundred percent. He's yeah. in. The, he's in. We've we've let now Tier Tart and Makai Becton. Tier Tart was a nose tackle. Makai Becton was a tackle for uh, a right tackle for the Jets last year. They have come in the building. They have since left. Yeah, so we don't I, know. I don't think that this is a done deal. I do think that they're going to be more uh, pressed to try to get a deal done with him though, because they've made that choice to pivot. Um, Trent Brown would be technically speaking, statistically speaking, the best lineman we brought in the best lineman that we would have brought in back to the joe burrow era um 
last year he played mainly left tackle, um, was very effective, didn't play a full season, and that's really his knock, right, is you get a guy that is very good when he's on the field, um, a Super Bowl winner, I believe. I think he yeah. played with uh, yeah. with the um, the Patriots in 2018 when they won their Super Bowl. And very effective when he's on the field, but he doesn't play – a lot. Um, he's always hurt, always banged up. When you're that size, it's really hard to play a uh, full season. You just get nicked up all the time, uh, whether it's a back or a strain or whatever. Um, that's the big issue with him. I think this is the second best move that they could make or the best pivot, I guess. Tier Tart would have been my number one. Um, but this being move number two allows your – your first round pick in the draft to be whatever you want it to be best player available. You're not forced to take a tackle because you can wait to the second round to maybe work on a guy to develop him. And there's plenty of those guys out there. This is one of the deepest tackles uh, classes I've seen in a long time. Uh, guys that come to mind like Patrick Paul, Tyler Guyton might fall. Um, and there, there's a kid from Yale. I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but he's really good too. Big football school. Um, Washington, they're, they've got two tackles. One of them is a top first, uh, top ten pick, but the other one, he's uh, right around that second, third round range. Lots of guys that they could take a chance on that I would feel comfortable with. They've got really good RAS scores, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think the move is to get their right tackle of the future in the top two rounds. But now they're not forced to take it in the first round like they would have been if they took T.R. Tart. Look, I have look. a dumb question, though. Everybody always wants to, to, to kill the tackles that the Bengals have had, right? And maybe maybe rightfully so. Maybe I'm They've off base okay. in saying this. But my point is it seems like the, the, the expectation level for these tackles is, is not realistic. I think, okay, let's say Trent Brown comes in. Some are going to say, okay, well, what about Lyle, uh, Lyle Collins? Was Collins really that bad? I mean, he, he got hurt towards the end of the year. I don't feel he like was, he was that bad. I do think that it was, there's two things that come to play here that, that, that jumped immediately to mind. One is, is that you play in a division that that has elite-level pass rushers. Yeah. Like, the best pass rushers yeah. in the whole entire sport reside in this division. You're going to find yourself in a, in a predicament in this division to where when you have to play these teams two times a year, that it's going to be hard to protect the quarterback no matter who you have. So, again, this goes back to the philosophy and what you want to do from a game plan standpoint. But at some point, I guess the question I have is, when does this fall on the feet of Zach Taylor or whoever it is that they're going to suggest that's coming up with the game plan itself as to why Joe Burrow isn't protected? Jake Browning, certainly towards the end of the season last year, you could argue, didn't get hit a whole lot. And some of that reason is because they just got the ball out quicker. And I get when you have Joe Burrow and you have Jamar Chase, and you have T. Higgins, and you had Tyler Boyd, and some of those game names might be gone now, that you want to try to extend plays. You want to throw the ball right. down the field. Right. But if the, if the other opponent isn't going to allow you to do so, then at some point I wonder if that's ever going to be a difference maker in a pivot that the Bengals try to make. Because I think I'm I, – Jonah Williams is, the, is where I keep coming back to. Is Jonah Williams really that bad? No, li listen, uh, the, the right tackles that the Bengals have had over the last three years have been okay. serviceable. Yeah, they've been okay. They haven't been bad. To, to talk about the things that, that you're bringing up is Joe Burrow needs to get rid of it quick, quickly. That's what he's kind of done, right? Like if you look at the, the, the time from snap to release, I think Joe Burrow is in the top five in the NFL. He might even be the top. He might even be the quickest from snap to release. But – Here's the thing about Joe Burrow is in this offense is it works best when plays are kind of extended. The way that I can describe that is remember when Joe Burrow was hurt at the beginning of the year? What were they trying to do? They were trying to get rid of it very quickly. They were doing these mid and short routes, and the offense wasn't very good, right, with a banged-up Joe where they were trying to say, hey, let's get rid of it quickly. Let's, let's just throw the ball and sling it as quick as possible, almost like a high school spread offense. Um, and then when he got healthy, they let him extend plays a little bit more, yeah, that's, that's where it's – the whole thing when it comes to, to tackles, they've been okay. Riley Reef, Lael Collins, Jonah Williams, they've been okay. You bring up a great point. Miles Garrett, TJ Watt are in this division, right? And then that's, that's not going to change. That just is what it is. You're going to have to play those guys four times between the two of them. You're going to play the Ravens, who have led the league in sacks two times as well. So all this is true. 
the reason that we talk about tackles is is it just seems like a revolving door. That's fair. We're getting mediocre to good play for a price tag that should indict that we should be getting great play. You look at the teams that, that win Super Bowls. You look at the teams that get there consistently, and what do they have? They have really good line play. And that's where the, the next elevation of the Cincinnati Bengals is, is can we just get this guy a lot, of, a lot of time? You look at the 49ers, great line play this year. And when they're starting left tackle, forget his name at the top of my head. Trent Williams. When Trent Williams wasn't there, Hall of Famer, Brock Purdy didn't look very good. When Patrick Mahomes doesn't have a great Hall of Fame-esque line, he doesn't look very good. So it's trying to take that next level and the consistent revolving door of Lael Collins and Riley Reef and Jonah Williams and now Trent Brown is good. It's a stopgap, but you still need to have a long-term plan to get to that next level. But as Casey brought up, if you sign Trent Williams for right tackle, if you sign a nose tackle um, to, to be a stopgap, you go into the draft with an incredible luxury. And that luxury is we can take the best player. We're not filling any holes. We can go in here. Who's available? Who's good? I don't want to have to take a tackle. I don't want to have to take a nose guard. I think there's a lot of good tackles in the draft. I think you, you can have some great options there. But I don't want to go into that first-round pick going, we need to get a tackle of the future. If a guy like Brock Bowers falls, if a guy like a wide receiver who's um, the white Washington, Rome. Oh, Dunes. Oh, Dunes. If he falls to 18, can we take that guy? Can we take an edge rusher at 18? I know that's crazy, but if someone falls in your lap, you can do that because you have no holes that need filled. There's some places that can get better, but there's no holes that need filled, and that's what I think the Bengals need to stress is going into the draft with absolutely yeah. no holes that need filled, places that can get better but do not need to be filled. Well, you use the term stopgap at the Bengals, which is similar. I mean, essentially they're trying to patch a problem, but they're not fixing the problem. And, they're, and, and the problem right. is, is they're trying to fix it with money. And ultimately, you know, realistically speaking, some of these guys that are great at their position get extended before they become available. Like if the Bengals have a Hall of Fame type right tackle that they're able to get through the draft, the chances of them allowing them to even get on the free market would probably would probably become right. null void. That's the that's the the ultimate issue. We, this is the thing about the NFL that makes it so great is that more times than not, you can't buy yourself away to a winning football team. You got to make good calculated decisions. They've not done that in the past with with tackles. If Jackson Carmen was was a great player, none of this would be even a conversation. Right. They wouldn't be going into the free agent pool every single year begging to try to find somebody to to fill a hole. And ultimately it comes down to the draft, which is maybe obviously again, if Trent Brown gets signed, that's great, but it comes down to can they finally hit or not. And I don't know there needs to be accountability. That's all I'm going to say. There needs to be accountability at some point within this Bengals organization if they miss again. How many times can you miss on tackles in a draft before, and I get Pollock, I don't know who it is. Again, this is where I'm saying I'm a casual. I'll put my hand up and say, I don't know who it is. But you can't just sit here and keep convincing me that nothing changes inside of that organization, and yet you continue to whiff and whiff and whiff and whiff on tackles. And they've hit a couple home runs. You, but, but again, the home runs that they've hit outside of T. Higgins, I guess, in the second round, have been top-level prospects, mostly. I mean, yes, Joe Burrow. And you can swing and miss on a, on a number one pick, okay? But I think it's safe to say it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that nobody in, in, in the NFL, if they had the first pick and they, and they needed a quarterback, wasn't going to take Joe Burrow. It was very similar to the Andrew Luck situation. To where there was only one guy you really had to take. It wasn't this. And again, this year you could make the case that Caleb Williams is that same type of player. If he turns out to be as good as Joe Burrow and Andrew Luck, then the Bears obviously will have some success. But my, my main point is, outside of Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, T. Higgins in the second round, they've not, and, I, and, I, and again, I don't know enough about Bengal fandom. You might say, well, what about this guy five years ago that got drafted in the fourth round? My point is, is there can't be any more Jackson Carmens. And I'm not trying to kill Jackson specifically, and I know there's right. been more and there, there's been other guys down the line. But I think that if a tackle becomes available in the first round, the Bengals— There will be. The Bengals, I'm saying that if they—this if, if, if comes down to whether how the Bengals value these guys. Because 
I would be very careful to try to play the value game in regards to the tackle position for the Bengals. And, and what I mean by that is they're going to do their big boards. They're going to do their own grading scales. And they're going to say, okay, we got, we got let's say, MIMS. They got, we, got, we got MIMS at a 95 grade or whatever, whatever scale they use. And we got this guy from Yale that we think might go in the third round. We got him at an 87. We don't think he's going to be as good as MIMS, but we're going to try to sneak him in in the third round. I would rather just say, you know what? Maybe we're drafting too high on this guy, but I feel like I'm going to get a home run with him, Mims, at this spot. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm not going to take the top tackle. I'm going to wait because I think I got a value in the third round or I got a value in Jackson Carmen in the second round. And you find yourself in this predicament to where instead of just using, instead of just using best need available without the exception of there being some superstar that you think that you need to have, you take the best player available for the position that you kind of need, which I know is not maybe all, it's not the thing that anybody would say out loud because best player available is the easy answer. It's always the easy answer. If you say we're going to take best player available in our organization, there's not going to be any pushback. But I'm saying at some point you have a, and again, I know I'm going to use a term that people hate, but you have a window of opportunity here. Like you have it, let's call it what it is. You have a window of opportunity with one of the best quarterbacks in the league. And yeah, you can sit here and make the case to me that you're going to have that opportunity in seven years because you're still going to have them. And you're gonna, but, but again, then the salary cap starts creeping in. So I, the, the, the Bengals are in a unique spot. I'm not saying there's a perfect way to go about it, but it seems like the draft's really the only way that they're going to find a consistent tackle that you're talking about. Right. Well, you, 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 you marked on the thing. Like, listen, you can't you, – look at what is available in free agency, Right. It's safeties. It's running backs. It's linebackers. Look at what's not available readily in free agency. Quarterbacks. Young tackles. Young edge rushers. It's because those things are the most valuable thing in the sport. When you get one of those that are, that are great, you don't let them walk. You let a Jesse Bates walk because you look at it like, hey, that's $20 million for a safety. I can get other guys in safety that, that'll get... Near. You let a Joe Mixon go because you're like, hey, I, I could probably get somebody else at running back. You don't let tackles go. You don't let quarterbacks go. You don't let great edge rushers go. So, yes, you're right. You're, you, we, we all know the secret to success in the NFL. You get a good quarterback. You get a good coach. You get a good tr- – and then you draft one, right? That's the third thing. You just consistently draft one. The reason that the, the, the Chiefs are good is because they've got a great coach, they've got a great quarterback, and they've hit on some drafts. That's the next evolution for the Bengals. Teams that often spend a lot of money in free agency. We always talk about going all in. We always talk about you got to spend money in the free agency to compete because look at what the the Los Angeles Rams did with Matt Stafford. Well, when we talk about what those teams did, there's a lot of teams that swung and miss. There's a lot of teams that go in the free agency. We always talk about who won free agency. More often than not, if you look in reverse and say, hey, this team, Last year, the Jets, they killed it in, they killed it in their offseason moves. Yeah, they weren't very good. I know their quarterback got hurt. But more often than not, the teams that consistently win just have a good quarterback and they draft well. And you're right. And that's where we're talking about. It is, this is a draft that has a really good tackle class at the, at the, at the top. Um, Zach Taylor, you are right. Where is the accountability? Like, if, if we miss again in, in the history of Zach Taylor's drafts, we've drafted Jonah Williams, eh. We've drafted um, Akeem Adeniji for a sixth rounder. Sure, that's fine. Cordell Volson was a hit in the fourth round as a starting lineman. That's a hit. Every other person, Jackson Carmen, Dante Smith, big old duds. So at some point, you've got to hit on that. And, you know, you, you, you keep going. I said if, if, if this year the line doesn't improve, because we brought in um, Frank Pollock to be this guru on the offensive line. If it doesn't work this year, then at some point we got to look internally and say we've got to make a change here. Yeah, it's like uh, that's the other quick point I was going to make is that okay, drafting is one thing, but development's a whole nother thing. Like at some point, yeah, I mean, I guess if you got a guy that you come in that you can't possibly mess up because they're so good, that's fine. But I don't know, and I, I think that there's this there's this notion around professional sports too that you know guys are just as good as they are and they're going to be who they are, and there's really not a whole lot of development that goes into being an NFL player. Once you get to a certain age, you are who you are. There's no changing it. You can try to do your best to kind of give some pointers. It's similar to maybe a hitting coach in Major League Baseball. What, 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 what the hell does a hitting coach actually do besides play maybe psychologist 
and maybe give a little tip here and there. But for the most part, the guys are who they are. Um, the, 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 thank God for Jamar Chase, though, because I was thinking about this yesterday. If Jamar Chase didn't pan out, and thank, again, thank God he did, but if, if Sewell ended up being the player that he is, and Jamar Chase, even if Jamar Chase got hurt, which you can't, you can't um, I guess you can't forecast, but if he did get hurt or something happened where Jamar Chase wasn't the player that he is, this draft class is, is unbelievably laughable. In 2021, they obviously took Jamar Chase, fifth pick of the draft. Then they took Jackson Carmen, Joseph Asai, Cam Sample, Tyler Shelvin, Dante Smith. Ooh, they did hit on Evan McPherson, if we're being honest. But that was a, that's, that, that, that's, that's a fifth, that's that's fifth rounder for a Super kicker. Bowl. That is maybe that saves the draft, if we're being honest. No, the twenty. Then you got Trey Hill, Chris Evans, Wyatt Hubert. The 2021 and 2022 drafts haven't seen a whole lot, especially the 2021. I mean, you can look at a draft and, and you know, how can you say that a draft that you got Jackson or Jamar Chase was a dud because of how great Jamar Chase is, top three wide receiver in the league? But you're, you're right. I mean, uh, Jackson Carmen, Joseph Asai, Cam Sample, Tyler Shelvin, Dante Smith, eh, 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 eh. maybe Joseph Asai can turn out to be a valuable piece in the future. But, but no, um, I look, we look at our last three draft classes. 2022's okay. You get a starter in Cordell Volson in the, in the fourth. You get a guy like Cam Taylor Britt who's coming into his own. We'll see what Dax Hill. Other than that, not a whole lot. I have a lot of – I'm very high on last year's draft class. I, I really like 2023's draft class. And they're going to get more chances to play this year. Miles Murphy is going to get a chance to start. DJ Turner looked great. Jordan Battle was the highest rated for, um, rookie safety. Um, we'll see with Yoshi had four touchdowns. Yeah. That's pretty good from a sixth rounder. Um, Charlie Jones returned a punt for a touchdown. Other than that, didn't do a whole lot, but that's okay. Chase Brown's going to get a lot of carries this year. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good draft class, but that, that's what you need to cons- do consistently. Everyone knows that. Casey's been trying to talk for 15 minutes. Yes, he has. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys have uh, hit on a lot of the points I was going to make, but I, w- I would just like to add a few different things about their draft strategy, how they approach the free agency, because I would say that the free agency approach for the Bengals – probably for the last five years, has been pretty good. I would say I would give it like a, a B-plus rating. Most of the time they're hitting on guys. Last year, not so much, but I feel like they, they kind of failed on the plan that they wanted to do. They wanted to keep Von Bell or Jesse Bates. They failed on that, so it kind of ruined their entire plan for free agency. They just kind of got Nick Scott and grabbed a tight end off the scrap heap, and you know they spent all this money on Orlando Brown Jr. We'll see if that actually pans out. Uh, I still think that's kind of out in the open, too. I mean, he's not been the greatest uh, left tackle out there in in the NFL. Um, This year, they didn't have a whole lot of spending in the the free agency, which is the part where it makes me a little concerned because that's where they've been pretty good at. The draft is very suspect to me, very suspect. Besides 2020, the Joe Burrow draft class, they've not really hit – on a draft class. They've had some success here and there on some guys, but they've never really hit a draft class like they did with 2020. And the good teams, they consistently hit on draft classes like the chiefs. They had three starters, four starters in one draft class in 2022. I mean, you can't, you can't consistently be hitting, uh, you can't consistently be not hitting on guys later on in the draft. And we said this time and time again. Like you said, 2021, really bad. Jackson Carmen, dud. Joseph Osai, I think we had some hope there. I think there's still some hope that he can be what a backup. Happened to him? But but at the same time, a third round pick that high should be doing a lot more than what he's doing. So I'm gonna call that somewhat of a bust. Cameron Sample is basically Joseph Osai, but in the fourth round. I'll take that. In fourth round, what? and and all the rest of the guys, I'm not even going to go through them because they're not nobodies. In 2022, Dax Hill just got benched for Von Bell, and and we just went out and spent a bunch of money at, at free safety with Stone. I don't know what Dax Hill is going to be at this point because he's not going to be your starting slot. He's not going to be your starting safeties. He's not going to be a starting corner, more than likely. I would love to see him start at corner, but – We'll see. I think that you would consider that a bust because he's not giving you we'll any see. starting yeah, any we'll starting see. talent at the moment. Zach it's, Carter. It's do or die for that. Zach Carter, 
Tyson Anderson, he's been hurt. So you missed one I, I though. You missed the former Husker, the current Bengal, and the future star, that. Cam Taylor Britt. Yeah, but that's the only player that's actually made it a big impact. Right. Cordell Voson was one of the worst guards in the first half of the year, and he got a lot better. But we had to change our entire scheme for that to happen. So I don't know. Is what? he going to be the left guard of the future? Probably not. So would you consider that a hit? You know what's silly? And, like, everyone's making fun. Like, we've we, we brought this point home 30 times in 30 different ways. But, yeah, you get the quarterback, you get the coach, you draft Will, you're going to be very successful in this league. You know what the Bengals haven't done that a lot of teams have done, very successful teams, is killed a late-round pick. Like, got an elite guy from a sixth-rounder. They haven't done that. I mean, there's there's a little bit of hope, and a guy like Yoshivas can turn into a to a really good – second second target for Joe Burrow, but I think that's more of a lottery tick. But but you look at like a, a team like the Rams that got uh Kyron Williams in the sixth round. They got Puka Nakua in the fourth round. Like that's that's huge. Can the Bengals do that? Can we get a guy that we, we draft like in the sixth round as a you know a cornerback or a linebacker or or heaven forbid an edge rusher that, that turns into be an elite guy? I know an edge rusher that, that turns into an elite guy from the sixth round. That doesn't happen. But how can – that's where it feels like another step can be is can, can we just, like, find a diamond in the rough? You're asking to get lucky. Correct. Like the other teams and the teams that, that have a lot of success consistently get, quote, unquote, lucky. I think that's fair. I mean, I think that's more, I think that's more of an actual thing in the NFL and the draft and, and the way that the season goes – than, than many people want to actually believe. I think that luck's a huge part of winning a Super Bowl, and some of that's just health. I mean, it, 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 I don't know how you justify or quantify whether or not you can keep guys healthy or not. Maybe somebody with, with, with the huge computer and some analytics can tell me why, but it, it comes down to can you keep some of your big-time players healthy or not going into the playoffs, and then from there do you execute? And it seems as if for whatever reason – um, there are certain teams that, that find a way to, um, to avoid what I would consider pretty bad luck. Um, the Chiefs, and again, luck is a really relative term, but the Chiefs have, and again, correct me if I'm wrong as the casual here, but they've never really had a significant injury to their offensive line. Now, I know Collins, some people are going to kill me for saying this. When Collins went down with that injury, he was playing better. The Bengals were playing better football towards the end of that season and it felt like that group was starting to mesh the beginning of the season was a little bit of a disaster if I remember right but again how are you supposed to forecast Lionel Collins getting hurt for the rest of the year towards the end of the season if that happens to the Chiefs and they're one of their and again I guess I can't really say one of their best linemen when I compare it to Collins because people are going to crush me for saying that but I don't care if you lose a tackle as the Chiefs uh do they replicate what they've been able to do? I think the answer is relatively no. Yeah, well, I mean, like the the, the Chiefs lost their tackles pretty pretty famously in the before the Super Bowl that they lost, right? Like the that was the one game against Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. They lost both tackles going into that Super Bowl and got killed, or else they might have won that game. At least it, it changes a lot, right? Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. Injuries happen, and you just you that's where the luck factor comes in can, can you keep guys healthy I mean, that's the same thing that we're talking about with with the Cincinnati Reds and everyone's up in arms saying oh my god this team can't stay healthy this team can't stay healthy there's a luck element to it but you just gotta you just gotta hope and pray I mean if you get 17 starts from your five starting offensive linemen you are in an unprecedented era of luck go get the powerball ticket you're gonna you're gonna be a millionaire because that's that's the same odds right so, yeah, I don't know. It's just the Bengals, as you said, the, 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 next, the next step. Everyone's worried about this, this offseason. Well, oh, they're, they're, they're canon. I think Drew Garrison just put it in the chat. It's a, it's a fantastic point. Where did the Bengals miss, right? What guy got huge money in free agent? What big free agent um, would have really fit really well into what the Bengals were doing? You could say DJ Reader bringing him back for $9 million. Sure. Trey so, Wayne's. But that was very early. I'm saying this year. Oh, no. I'm saying this year what, what fits what the Bengals were, were trying to do. And outside of DJ Reader, not a whole lot. There's, not, there's no big tackles that fit. There wasn't any other nose guards besides DJ Reader that fit. 
So, yeah, you just got to keep, keep hitting on the draft picks. That's where every team makes their money. Fan base would have lost their mind if they signed Jonah Williams to a relatively sizable deal. Correct. Yeah? Correct. Yeah. Which is funny because I think if Jonah Williams played for another team and they signed him to the same deal, the, the fan base reaction would have been like, well, you know, he, he could figure it out. He might be able to be a good player here. Because it's just funny how when you have players that are on your team and they either are average or maybe a little below average or maybe even a little above average, they get viewed upon – sometimes in a negative light based off of the circumstances that happen that might not have been a direct reflection of their fault. Like, is, was, was there any tackle in the entire league that could have stopped Joe Burrow from pulling his calf last year and hurting his wrist? The answer is no. Trent Williams would have helped. <laughs> you, you say that, but the answer is undoubtedly no. Yet, we look back on the fact that since Joe Burrow was hurt, we want to blame somebody because that's our human element. That's the, that's the nature that we are as, as just human beings. Most people would like to blame somebody. And it seems like the offensive line always gets blamed for Joe Burrow's injuries. And I'm not suggesting that, that, that there, are, there isn't some semblance of reason to that. But, again, I just think it's kind of in a unique situation right now with, with fandom, with the NFL, where, again, like you said, a week ago – uh, the Bengals could do no wrong, and then a week later, now all of a sudden, it's twelve the, hours. The, 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 uh, uh, twelve hours. Then all of a sudden, you know, basically hell is frozen over. Uh, tomorrow's show is going to be basically nothing but uh, March Madness. For those that are very, very, very into that, I again, to be clear, I do love March Madness. Um, although I think it's maybe, maybe my my love for it has has fallen off a little bit. But I used to be a nut job when it comes to the bracket. I used to know. Basically, after about three hours after the brackets came out, I used to be able to memorize every single spot where everybody was. And I'll be honest, at this point, um, I've not really dove deep into it. It does seem obvious to me, though, that I think that I, have, I now am in a position where I've gotten bullied into being a pro-Purdue guy because it seems like everyone's anti-Purdue. And I'm like, I don't know if I should do that or not because I might end up looking like an idiot. But I do want to remind everybody that Virginia, they got, they got beat by a 16 seed. They came back the very next year, and they won the whole damn thing. So to sit here and be like, well, Purdue, they're frauds. Look at them. They, look, well, look what happened to them last year. They're the same type of team. I mean, maybe. But they might just win the whole damn thing, too. And I would argue there's really only a handful of teams that can win the whole thing. Uh, that's my favorite thing about March Madness every year as well, is everybody acts like, look at the parody in college basketball. Look how unbelievable it is to watch these first-round games and how close these games are. You got teams like Samford. They can beat Kansas. And then all of a sudden you look at the end of the, 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 end of the bracket and you got North Carolina playing Duke, you got Kansas playing Villanova, and then somebody's going to win the national championship out of those four teams, and it just happens to be the Blue Bloods. Last year, we all could agree that UConn was a team that was playing the best basketball towards the end of the year outside of their little scuffle inside of the Big East play there for a short amount of times last year. UConn was beating the brakes off of everybody, and they just beat the brakes off of everybody and won the national championship. It seems like that's very capable of happening again. There's only like three teams. Okay. There's like four teams, I think, that can win a national championship. Is there, is there any sport that is – I love March Madness. I think it's great. I don't think they should change a single thing about it. But is there a sport that is worse at picking their champion than, than college basketball? And what I mean by that is, like, if you take in the whole context of it all, right – how well you play in the regular season, how and then, then then you play one game in the championship or play a series or something like that. College basketball has the most random champions more often than not. Like how often have we seen the best team in basketball win the college college basketball tournament, right? It's how often does that happen? Not a, not not often. Hey. Which one would argue that's the that 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 uh, okay, it's the most it's the most entertaining way to, to crown a champion. Right. It's, it's, it's okay. also I'm the a... worst way to crown a champion. Correct. If we can be completely honest. I'm okay We are with not it. trying to find out who the best team in college basketball is under any stretch of the imagination. If we did that, you, talk, you take like what? Maybe the top eight teams and you play, you do like the NBA you do, playoffs. You do five, yeah, you do yeah, a five-game five five game series, seven-game series, which all, honestly at this point, I mean, not, I'm not trying to – that would be electric. Uh, could you imagine having great. a team to where you actually had home games and a championship? Like – that atmosphere would be unbelievable. I'm not, again, the, here's the problem in sports too right now. Not to go on my, here, here's a tangent for all the tangents and people think I get uh, toxic traces. Like, I am so sick and tired of championships in every sport becoming a corporate event. 
it sucks. It literally is what it's become outside of Major League Baseball, maybe. And Every other NBA. championship has become this, this, this glad handing around, finding corporate sponsors, giving away all the tickets, and then all of a sudden it's like, I, th- I think Joe Burrow said when they played it, he played in the um, uh, Super Bowl, it was like they were playing inside like a business meeting. He said it didn't even really get loud at all. I, and again, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, I don't know, but I'm here to say that the NFL seems like they can do no wrong. But they're starting to, they're starting to, do, you know, you probably wonder sometimes, like, how does, again, I'm going to show my age, but how does Sears ever get themselves in a position where they, they they're basically no longer exist? How does Amazon overtake them? How does, how does Blockbuster in the 90s, how can they possibly ever imaginable be out of business? And then you start to ask yourself, well, they got greedy. They started to act like they could do no wrong. I'm not saying the NFL is any, any, any short time is going to find themselves in that position, but it does seem like they're starting to be like, they think they can do no wrong. They're like, you know what? We're going to play 18 games. You want to, you want to watch the, you want to watch the playoffs. That's fine. Go watch Peacock. You got to, you got to sign up for Peacock. You want to, you want to, you want to watch football on Thursday. That's cool. You got to have Amazon prime. And all of a sudden it just turns into like major league baseball where again you got to have like nine different networks to be able to figure out a way to watch your favorite team and i'm not saying the nfl is even remotely close to major league baseball when it comes to marketability and where they're at in in in, in regards to popularity as a game but i do wonder sometimes when when i'm basically damn near dead and gone because i'm sure at some point that major league baseball people would tell you there's no way baseball could ever not be the most popular sport in this country I do wonder sometimes, and it's something for you to think about the rest of the day and, 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 and continue to basically not be productive at work, is what would it take for the NFL to not become the most popular sport in this country? I don't know exactly what it is, but it will happen. It's going to happen. At some point, the yeah, NFL will not be the most popular sport. In the, in the sport that you, you – like, probably when it does happen, the sport isn't even on your radar about what could overtake it. Right, it's probably not some long-standing league. It'd be something that would be new and unique to the times and the age of um, sports. You know, what's interesting is if the NFL goes to an 18-game schedule and does the things that the owners want to do to make more money, which is an 18-game schedule, they'd probably have to put a second buy in. They would probably want to expand the postseason to have another round, to where the NFL season would be over six months. It'd be like 28 weeks, which is over half the year. And if you're already tired of NFL talk now, imagine when it, <laughs> when it circumferences it, another four weeks of, of them actually playing, not even not playing. So, yeah. I don't know. By the um, way, by the way, Purdue, they lost the 16-seeded Farley Dickinson last year. They lost, they lost to 15-seeded St. Peter's in 2022. They lost to 13-seeded North Texas in 2021. That's why I don't believe in Purdue. That's not a one-off. They've lost to a 13-plus seed the past three years. I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy I'm gonna buy the hype, I guess, as we say on this program. You're buying low is um, what you're doing. Yeah, I, it just seems like they can't be that bad. It seems, it seems smart to buy They low. do get all the calls. They do get all the calls. When Zach Eady's down low, they're going to call 15, 15 fouls on him in the first five minutes. That's what he's got going. Your bo- by the way, your boy's outside if you want to bring him in. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where he's going to sit. That's what I was looking around. He just, can, hey, take, take my uh, he can just come by me. Look at Reed. He's, you know, this is the thing that Reed does. Now, now here's the thing. I want to be very clear. Reed is, is, he is, he is, he is doing this himself, okay? I asked yesterday. I said, Reed, I would like you on the show, but Cameras I didn't Miami off, baseball. Cameras off. Trace <clears throat> told me, get out, of the, get out of the room. That's what Reed's going to do now. See, this is Reed's play. This is part of his game plan. This is part of his strategy is he's going to, he's going to find a way in now which spin this on me and say that I kicked him off the show. To be very clear, Reed is going to be on the show every single day as long as he doesn't have somewhere that he has to be and he tells me that he doesn't want to do it or can't do it. I mean, you can... You Go can, ahead. I just said yeah, it out I've, loud. So I've, now I've, you're going to have a hard I've time made it, convincing. I've made, it, I've made it a bit that I got kicked off the show, but let me, let me be very clear about what happened. Tom said we're expanding. He's doing the morning show. Trace is taking over, and we're talking about how the new show's going to look. And Trace, from the rip, wasn't like a discussion. Was He's like, all right, so Elliot's going to sit over here. It's just going to be me, Elliot, and Casey in the room. And I'm like, okay, okay, that, that, that's fair enough. And I, I didn't say anything. Listen, I'm a soldier. I take, I take my orders. I do it, put the nose on the grindstone. And I, and, I, and, I, and I just keep moving forward, keep the feet marching, right? Left foot, right foot, whatever the marching chance they have, and that's what I did. 
And then they said, hey, we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to go on this, this trip to spring training. And I was like, ah, oh, I've got to do Miami. And then Trace is like, well, I mean, we're also going to go to, like, Lawrence, Kansas and, like, Denver and the Grand Canyon and, 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 and Vegas and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, that, that sounds like fun. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. But I, mean, I was never going to go because Trace, Trace didn't want me there. He didn't want me on the trip. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm glad he came on and, and gave the segments when he did and just slandered every time he came on the show. It, it went, went well. I'll get Jeremiah. <laughs> that's Reed Mouse. <laughs> um, you know, some of that's deserved. Some of that's deserved. And uh, I think it's more than fair for what he said. For, for no, I'll say most of it, but for some of it, certainly. Um, but you, you, the funny thing in life is, uh, is that you just never know what's going to happen, right? You, you try to plan things out. You think you got a good grasp on the way the world works, and then you realize that you, 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 you're, you're not really making a whole lot of decisions on your own. Now, whether or not you believe, uh, again, not to turn this into a religious thing, but whether you believe someone else is controlling the wheel or whether you think that you have full control of it is not mine. But I think we find ourselves in a position where we, me and, uh, me, me and Elliot, were talking about this road trip, and we are like, we need, we need videographers. We, we can't do all this on our own. Turns out we were right. One thing, one mistake I did make was I thought to myself after about halfway through this trip that we have all the footage, and I think the, the idea was to have uh, somebody on the trip to edit it while we were going. And it was going to be one of those things where while we were on the road, they were going to try to edit it. Well, it turns out that, that, that kind of the way in which that person that was going to do that kind of had like, uh, I guess I'll, I use the, the term car sickness, I guess is what I'll say it is. I don't know whether, I guess motion, sick, motion sickness. They weren't able to sit in the back at the table in which you could use to, to edit and do those types of things. Uh, it, it was a weird phenomenon because some of us could do it, some of us couldn't. I guess that's the whole thing with like, uh, you know, maybe you get on a cruise ship and some people are perfectly fine and some people just can't handle it at all. But, uh, but I guess I found out that myself and Nick Kirby especially have no problems at all with motion sickness. Elliot, to be fair to him, the one time he got back there to do a live show, it was probably the rockiest road we had rode on the entire time of the trip. So I'm going to give him a pass and say that I don't think you have full on uh, motion sickness. But what I'm getting at is that we had to find somebody to, to help us go on this trip. So I reach out to a guy that I know that's done things with us before. And he said, Hey, you know, I, I'm busy. I do know a guy though. That turns into, he sends me to this other guy, the second guy, uh, the second guy now that's a videographer. He was booked, ready to go. We were only going to take him. That was it. After about three or four days, he did tell me on the front end, he's like, I got this job that I've been trying to get for like three years. I don't think I'm going to get it. But if I get it, I just want you to know I'm not going to be able to go on the trip. I was like, that's fine. Well, this guy calls me like four days later and apologizes profusely to me. He's like, I, I'm so sorry, man. I don't know why you're apologizing to me. This is a two-week trip. I'm paying you, you know, I'm paying you a little bit of money, yes. But at the same time, you don't need to apologize. You go take your job or whatever. He's like, I got another guy. I'll refer you to. So he refers me to this other guy. So now we're three guys in, by the way. Well, that other guy, he was like, What's, what trip are we going on? And I was like, I asked one simple basic question to fo folks when I asked them this. And the question was, do you like sports? And if the answer was no, I'm not saying that was a red flag, Elliot, but it certainly was a really, 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 really damning thing to try to get over. Yep. Do you imagine being on this road trip with someone that just didn't like sports at all? Be now, tough. that was the concern I had was, we hire this person, they get on this road trip, they're filming us, they don't think we're funny, because sometimes people don't think we're funny. And then on top of that, they don't even like any of the sports. So he's like, hey, I got this other, I got this, uh, I got this um, intern, I think is the term that he had used. I got this intern, he'd like to go on the trip. If, if you don't think it's in the budget for me to go, then, then blah, blah, blah. Well, it wasn't so much the budget as it was just like, you know, a vibe thing, right? So I reach out to some people, turns out we find someone else. But the one guy that he said this intern, Turned out to be a, a, a kid named Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah obviously jumps on the microphone during one of our live shows. He becomes instantly chatterbox famous, I guess is the right word to use here. I don't know. Everybody's telling me this, that, and the other. I get a text last night from Jeremiah, and he says, hey, um, uh, I, I want to clean out the van. You think I could clean out the van for just a little bit of money? I, I need to make a little bit of money. I was like, you know what, Jeremiah? Uh, why don't you just come up here and we'll talk about it? So here he is, back in back in the flesh. Jeremiah, I, I, you came back to see us here. Um, 
I guess really quickly, overall, your thoughts on the trip. You don't have to sugarcoat this by any stretch of the imagination. You can save the high points, the low points, everything in between. Maybe yeah. don't divulge everything under the sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, your overall kind of thoughts, the vibes that you got on the trip, your, your enjoyment level. So the trip was great. Now, the, now here's the thing about this. this that there's a microphone, and you do need to speak. You know, not directly into it. Yeah. You don't have to here? eat it, but you have to speak a little bit, you know, loud. So uh, the trip was great. Obviously, everybody I was on the trip with was awesome. I think the low point would probably be Bear Lake when and originally in the morning I woke up and I decided that going to this frozen mountain on top of a frozen lake, I, I decided that wearing a T-shirt with some jeans was going was going to be the move. Now, Trace corrected me and saved me in the beginning, but... No matter what Trace could do for me, I didn't bring winter clothes for some reason that none of us understand. Well, uh, you, you, well I, I, I think I understand why. Uh, you, you, you are young, um, but all on top of that, if he thinks that the low point was Bear Lake, Elliot, he's just wrong. I mean, there's nothing else to I say mean, outside well, of that. Well, uh, other than the smoke-filled Airbnb that we all had to sleep together in the last day, that was pretty bad. That was brutal. Yeah, that was terrible, Elliot. Um, but, you know, I think my most favorite point was the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was awesome. The NHL game, very underrated. That was also amazing as well. Um, but, you know, there's not really too many downsides when you go on a trip like that, you know. I guess maybe I wish we could have stayed in Vegas another day. But The know. downside for me was that you got me sick, and I'm still <laughs> battling it right now to this day. Hey, we all are. We two are. people two people got sick. Jeremiah got first. You could argue it all came down to one video where uh, we recorded it. There was this Who's dog. got that video? You do. It's on your phone. I do? Yeah. So there was this dog outside of a gas station. And this dog, it looked like it's seen better days, but it looked friendly. Yeah. So I went out, and I'm like, hey, Trace, can we bring this dog in this van? I think that would be elite content. We'll, we'll, we'll adopt Absolutely this. not. You did not just say that. We'll adopt. I'll we'll, tell my story when you're done. We'll adopt this dog, and, and it'll be the Chatterbox dog, and we'll bring him with him. We'll bring him with us all across the nation. So I, I get out and I pet it a little bit. I, I didn't pet. I pet it with one hand. With my left hand, I pet it like its little ear, uh, and that was it. Jeremiah then got out, and this dog became one of the most friendliest dogs of all time. He started rolling on his back. He was just having a good old time. Jeremiah was kissing it, scratching it, loving it. I think about two days after, maybe less, maybe less than 48 hours after, Jeremiah came down with an illness. <laughs> no, it was less than a day. It after. was less than a day. Yeah, yeah. And then I was, and I was praying to God that it was its own separate thing. Because let's, let's be clear, when you have six guys in a van, someone's probably going to catch something. You're stuck in there. Not a lot of great ventilation. Uh, but about... I want to say five days after Jeremiah caught this, I caught it. It's, it was the same symptoms. Whatever he got, he gave it right to me. Uh, and, and the only thing I can point to that who gave it, and it was that dog. I was, yeah. was going to say that that dog was a great dog. I loved it. I wanted to adopt it. Now I wish bad things happened to him. That dog is terrible. Because that dog got us both sick yeah. and put us in a bed. I'm still trying to breathe. I can't breathe out my, my nose. My nose has been running for six days. Yeah. yeah. It's, a serious, yeah. it's a serious issue. Uh, so I was wrong. Hand up. If there was anything I was wrong about on this trip, it was that uh, Nick Nick Kirby, by the way, looked like he hated dogs. He, he, he never wanted to touch a dog any less than this dog. So I should have listened to him. I should have I listened to him and went on my dog hatred ways and sat in the van and not pet it. But uh, that, was my, that was my low light probably. Uh, I don't know. Hey, listen, uh, I'm uploading it into the drive right now, Casey. It'll gotcha. be there. We'll make that the cherry on top. Why not? Uh, if it actually ends up getting there and loading in time. But here's the thing. When, 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 when Elliot sits here and he puts on this brave face of saying, you know, oh, I, I, I suggested, you know, maybe bring it on, blah, 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 blah. No, no. He, he, he was demeaning us. He was telling us that we were absolutely criminally leaving this dog behind. Meanwhile, we show up. We show up to this gas station, by the way, in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. I mean, when I say we've done that bit a little bit, you know, like, oh, we're out here in the middle of nowhere, Indiana. Okay, well, there's exits. There, we're, we're somewhere. Clearly, we don't know where we are, but there, we're somewhere. When I tell you we were somewhere between the Grand Canyon and I think it was uh, Denver is where we were at. I mean, genuinely have no clue where we're at. Pull over to a Sinclair gas station uh, that – just had weeds and everything else running under the sun. And this dog is already, he's at a different car. Comes over to us. And at first I'm like, I don't know. This is pretty sketch. I don't even know if I'm going to get out. Turns into like 
three minutes after that, Elliot is suggesting to me that I am criminal for not putting this dog in the van that we that we have no clue about. Not as gonna wouldn't have a, a, a we wouldn't be able to bathe the dog before we took it. We're just gonna take the dog. And you genuinely, you can say whatever you want. You genuinely were semi mad at me. No, I was not. I was, yes, you I, were. That was that was a bit. No, uh, it wasn't a bit. It was very clearly. It was a bit. not a bit. It was nothing. You were mad at me because I didn't take a stray dog off the streets because you said, "Look how nice it is." Are you serious? You don't like dogs? You a dog hater? And then you basically t- told Kirby straight to his face that he hated dogs. Well, Kirby is a dog hater. Kirby, 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 legit like showed that yeah. he had wanted no part of any dog ever. So Kirby might actually hate dogs. Yeah, he openly uh, admitted that. But no, I, I, I that was a bit. I, I had no. Are you sure it of, was a bit? Are, I, yeah. You're lying. Like I had the, no, the, the, right I, now you are lying straight into the faces of all the people that watch this show because I know for a fact you were disappointed because you looked at me and you're like you're really just gonna. You looked at me and you dropped a. You're really just gonna leave this dog here to die? I'm like this dog has been here for what seems like a couple years. Uh yeah, I mean if I'm gonna be the hero here and I want to say I wanted to keep a dog that could have died the next day. When we could have prevented its death, yeah, I, I'll say that. I'm a hero. I, I, you know, pat myself on the back a little bit. But I would say that was a bit. I would say we, uh, nobody had any intention of keeping that dog whatsoever. And when the people see the video, okay, and here it is. Uh, this is the video. Go ahead. I don't know if you have it. If you're ready to play it, go ahead and just play the video. All right. Um, so it's, we're at a, it, this is the dog. We're at a gas station. Right outside. And this right dog outside the car. or wolf is staring outside of us. He's standing right outside, and I don't know what he's doing. Jeremiah is going out to tame him. You want to you join the chatterbox squad, boy? Oh, he's licking me. Oh, that's a dog. Oh, he's really. And this is where the sickness me. began. <laughs> now, Aww. listen. I know when you watch when you watch this, there's Man. no doubt that keeping the dog is, is certainly yeah, something we, that's viable. If you're not on a 13-day road trip. Okay, across the middle of the country with six people already in the van. It's impossible to keep the dog. Yet, you sat there and you wanted to belittle me for, for not taking the dog. Which Lindsay, I think is just preposterous. Lindsay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how cute was that dog? 10. Yeah. That dog was really cute. It was very <laughs> cute. I'm surprised you guys didn't take it. Yeah, it so <laughs> yeah that's what I was saying. <laughs> it was so skinny, too. It, like, hadn't eaten in three years. Something, something absurd. No, th- listen, if we weren't on a 13-day road trip with a bunch of random people in a van uh, and the <laughs> dog could have had rabies and everything else under the sun, yeah, I, I probably would have said, yeah, let's do something. But that's not the case. So I guess I'm the bad guy here. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. But, uh, but outside the, uh, the dog, we didn't really run into too many other hiccups. But you're going to blame basically what you've done now is you've blamed Jeremiah and that dog, Elliot, for your sickness. Because your immune system isn't good. Meanwhile, I just want to let you guys know, I was in the same position that Elliot was been in. I think I stayed basically in the same area, the same rooms, all the same things, yet I'm not sick. I don't know why that would be. Would that, become, would that be an immune system thing, you think? Or no? I don't know. I guess your immune system's better than mine. I thought mine was pretty damn good up until yesterday or two days ago, whenever I came down with it. But Jeremiah clearly has put a spell on me. And, and, and I don't know. My next week is probably ruined. I probably won't be able to watch March Madness because I'll be sick. You know, you, you expressed to me that you have the best immune system known to man. I do. You told me that you do not get sick. I don't. Not even 24 hours goes by, and you come back to the van, your nose is pouring snot. That's right. And you're telling me how you're sick. Yeah, I, so. I don't know what to say. I, you clearly have done a number on me, and that dog, <laughs> yeah. that very, very cute dog, poisoned us. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I can agree on everything up to the fact that I did not give you any illness. I didn't cast a spell. I think it was just the disgusting dog. That we had hearts for for some reason. Yeah. There you go. Uh, the dog wasn't disgusting. I think it was just in a predicament. And unfortunately, we weren't in a spot to be able to help it or save it. Um, all right. Now we find ourselves in a position where you, you, you're going to clean out the van, as you said, for money. That's what you yeah, want to uh, do? Yes. I what other like talents to. do you think that you could have here that might help us? Anything you need, Trace. I don't have it all, but I can learn it all. <laughs> Look at that. What do you think? It's the attitude of a winner. Yeah, we don't lose over here. You know, we could have been 200 up on a Kansas State versus Kansas game, but, <laughs> you know. You know he bet that, right? Huh? You know he bet that, oh, right? Oh, he did? Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot because I actually told you how that I was disappointed in you during the game. Correct. But it was like after the fact you already made the bet. Yeah, I did. So, I did uh, do that. Uh, yeah, never mind. Uh, another thing that I, that, that I, I do want you to know, though, is I, 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 uh, the money that I did win, uh, fortunately, because Kansas won that game, uh, I, I lost in the first night of Vegas. 
Um, not 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 at the casino floor though. Just from the the nuts that uh, that somebody decided to eat out of their room. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? So to be fair, to be fair, it was trail mix and gummy bears. Now, yeah. you like I see the trail mix. I walk in and mind you, I'm starving. Like I'm I'm so hungry. We're dri- we're driving for so long, and I'm looking around. I see the in room dining, and I'm like, all right, that's where you pay. And then I see the snacks, and I'm like, all right, never been to Vegas, massive hotel. First day here, these like we have to eat these. Like they're wrapped in gold. It's sure. literally what they're for. So I eat the snacks, but I didn't see in the very tiny text that you got to squint your eyes and put a monocle on to read that you have to pay for them and that there are sensors. Now I did some inspecting after I cost myself around seventy bucks for these little yeah. bags of snacks, and it does in fact say that there are sensors and that the room is automatically charged. And yeah, yeah, it was very. It was weird. It was a weird experience. You've now, never been in a hotel before. Not one as nice as that. I mean, we walked in there and I asked Trace, literally, where are we? I was like, this is, this is amazing. But, um, you know, if I'm ever back or when I'm back, I will not touch those snacks. I actually have a personal vendetta against all gummy bears in the state of Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> the gummy bears were good, though, for being I mean, honest. They were, he, decided, he, he decided he was going to pass those around after he was sick, by the way. Um, I might have done it too. Yeah, yeah who knows where we actually got this sickness? It could have been um, a double quinto. There were so many things that happened on this trip. Where I sleep on the floor. There, 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 there were so many things that happened on this trip. It's hard to really kind of get through all of this in one one show. There's gonna be random stories that pop up probably from now until a good amount of time. Uh, a couple things that we got to do that I thought were really really unique and cool. One of one of them was one of them was the NASCAR. I thought that that was like you just don't get an opportunity probably to do the things that we were doing. Now the one thing I kept thinking to myself is like. I am so naive to everything that's going on around me that I'm that, that this is a whole nother world. Like I, I, I have no, when I tell you, I have no clue what they're doing. I have no clue what they're doing. They have garages back there. They're, they're doing certain adjustments and you have the, you have one thing I did take away from the NASCAR that I'd never thought about was the sheer athleticism and what looked like middle linebackers in the NFL, and those were basically the pit members, the pit crew. Correct. I was I was walking down the, the pit road, and there was a guy doing calisthenics down down the oh, yeah. pit road, and he looked like he was getting ready to go play uh, basically in the NFC Championship game. That's 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 what it looked like. So I give all the credit in the world to those pit members. The the gas tanks they look like they weigh like 250 pounds. So kudos to those guys for being able to pick them up. I think a funny bit would actually be seeing seeing how fast the chatterbox crew could actually get somebody in and out of the pits. It would probably be like, you know, maybe 30 minutes. But just seeing you, Elliot, I just seen you, and I was thinking to myself, what would it be like, not to make fun of you here, but what would it be like to see you try to pick up one of those gas cans and fill up a car? You think you'd have that in you or no? I don't have that in me. I don't have that in me. There was a video that there, there was a video out there that uh, took the internet by storm where it looked like I didn't know how to fill up a gas tank. Yeah, and you didn't. I didn't know how to fill up a gas tank. Lindsay, if Lindsay was in my spot, she wouldn't have known how to do Lindsay, it either. Lindsay, have, have you ever seen a gas station that, where you have, to flip the, you have to flip up the I thing at the bottom? I saw this video. I've never seen that before. Thank you. Wow. I have never I mean, seen that thank before. Casey, getting, I'm getting older. Have you ever day. had to do that before? Where you had to flip the thing up? Yeah. No, but I've seen it. I've okay. seen it before, so. Seems like, a lot of people, seems like a lot of people just have never had to do it. What about you, Jay? Have you ever had to do it? I did have to do it. I just looked at the thing that said lift, and I lifted it. No, 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 no. Before no, this. It's, before it's this. Fair. Before this. No, yeah. Like, like, You've had to do it before. Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I was lost at first, but I just, like, kind of looked around, and then I saw the arrow pointing up on it, and I was like, well, maybe. But, I mean, to be fair, there was no arrow on his, I don't think. Was there? Was there an arrow on it telling you to lift it up? I don't remember. If I'm going to be honest with you, I had no idea where to lift. There was. It so. said lift here, and that's that. All right, so here's the thing. I, Jeremiah, we're going to have to figure out some kind of situation. People are asking me. Um, give the kid a chance, give the kid a chance. Uh, I do think that there's a lot of things that I'd like to say uh, about Jeremiah, although I don't want to divulge too much too fast. But I think that overall, um, whether or not you're with us for a long time, you will be successful if you continue the same attitude that you have. I genuinely mean that. I appreciate you were that. a team first guy. You did whatever we asked. Uh, you didn't complain at all. Um, so I do – I. I do think that uh, whatever you decide to do, genuinely, you'll have success if you decide to have that same attitude and you, and you just try to find a way to win. That said, there is, there's a lot of video content we have here. I know you said you, did, you haven't done a lot of editing yet, and you said, you, what, what's, the, what's the thing that you always tell me? You can learn. You're yeah, a fast you, learner is what I've yeah, heard. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I say, instead of you cleaning out the van, if you want to clean out the van, by all stretch of imagination, sure, I'll help you out. You can clean out the van today. We'll, we'll give you some money um, so you can take care of the things that you need to take care of. But I say that you, uh, you start, I'll, I'll teach you what I know. I'm not a professional editor, but I'll teach you what I know. And uh, you can try to start editing out this vlog that we thought we were going to be able to try to do. Turns out we can't do um, while we're on the trip. So you'll do that. And then we'll see where this goes from there. We'll see. We'll see what the people want. So I, I don't want to sit here and suggest for a second that you know, um, call home, call home and tell them that you got a full time job around here. But um, we'll see if we can't keep you around. Nutcutter Nation, uh, our members would probably appreciate you filming us when we do stupid stuff around here from time to time because they probably think that's funny. Speaking of which, we did do a decent amount of uh, video uh, members only videos when we were on the trip. Uh, one of them was the Welcome Center to what state? Kansas? Mm, Colorado? Colorado. Colorado. Anyways, it was a wild video. Wild. Wild video. One in which did I'm they, glad did, it's behind a paywall. Did Nick edit the final? Did Nick edit the end of that video or no? Or we leave that? Nope. In? No, it was left. that one in. That All was right. left in. That's For good figured. or bad, I don't know. Okay. It's it's, it's there. It is what it is. Um, so we'll see what this video looks like, but I do think to tie a ribbon around the, uh, the bow that is the Chatterbox trip, um, having you do your first video ever editing this vlog would be funny. I think it'd be like <laughs> Jeremiah's first edited video he's ever made also is the way in which we encapsulate that trip. So that's the deal I'm offering. Okay. I'm willing to take that deal. All right. Sounds like a good deal. Fair enough. So that's that. Business on the show. All right, it's 1221. We went overtime. As I said, we probably would. I really appreciate everybody's nice comments and even the ones that aren't so nice for welcoming people back. Final thoughts before we end the show. Uh, just a couple things I want to say really quickly. Those of you that are still in the chat, please give us a like. Uh, we had like over 200 people in here in this chat, and I don't think we got near enough likes that, uh, that we should have got. So please give us a like. And if you want Jeremiah to be full-time, you can become a member and pay a salary. It's simple as that. Yeah. Just go to our channel and uh, click on um, our membership tab. And uh, we have a $10 membership, a $25 membership. Uh, the more the merrier, and it'll make Jeremiah happy, I'm sure, if you become a member. So, yeah. yeah. If we, how many members do we have? We have like 40. We have 40 members. Yeah. Including me. <laughs> so 39. <laughs> That's yeah. not cutting the Chatterbox fans. If we get to 80. Ooh, double. If we get to 80, um, then 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 we'll find we'll find we'll find something that we'll do that um that'll probably please some people so the reds right. are getting ready to start there's a lot going on we got espn radio next week how we're gonna do that i have no i have no clue i, I really don't know how we're gonna do that i gotta start practicing or something we're supposed to do 15 minute segments right five yeah. minutes on 15 minute segments how we, i mean that that would require a professional that would require somebody that actually has a plan here i just show up and I'm like, you know what? Today, what are we going to talk about? I probably should be better about that. I'll put my hand up in the air and saying that it's my fault that we don't have the likes that we were supposed to have today. That's on me. The host the of the show, the host of the show, that's on me. The host of the show should, should ask for likes throughout the show. Oh, uh, likes? Likes, yes. Likes, you know, the thumbs up button. I think you said lights. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So. All right. Well, that ends it for my first time back in quite some time. It's been a, pri uh, it's been a privilege. It's been an honor. Uh, shout out to Jolly Jolly. He's already in the chat. He helped us out with the NASCAR. Very, very, very good man. And he also let us uh, basically uh, drive his rental car through the, uh, the Arizona desert that he had no clue about, that he probably will enjoy seeing when we actually edit the video. That's a story for another day. There's a lot of stories on that trip for another day. And hopefully Jeremiah can edit them because that's what he's, that's his first job here at Chatterbox Sports. We'll see how he does. Take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk all March Madness for Sean Connor because that's all he ever wants to talk about. Good night.